agrair-vos que hagueu vingut, esperem que l'acte us interessi, agraïm molt als ponents que hagin acceptat venir, us dono la benvinguda en nom del Grens, que és el grup de recerca en Estats, Nacions i Sobiranies, explicar-vos que en la nostra universitat tenim tres llengües oficials, una en la que estic parlant, el castellà i l'anglès, els ponents triaran les llengües en les quals parlaran, ara ho estaven decidint els ponents i el Joan Pau Rubíes i el Fernando Guirao faran la seva intervenció en català, les preguntes posteriors es podran adreçar a les llengües que vulgueu i la part que dedicarem en tram amb el professor Enrico Solai de Cal, la professora Jones i el professor Jacobson ho faran segurament en anglès. Però torno a repetir que les preguntes es podran formular en l'idioma que ho considereu convenient. No els vull prendre més temps. Ah, també vull presentar la moderadora, encara és doctoranda per problemes acadèmics, és la Mariona Lloret, molt aviat serà doctora, i la seva tesi precisament tracta sobre populisme, per tant és la moderadora perfecta per un acte sobre nous populismes, encara que ella estudi populismes, diguem-ne, que més vells, però també nord-americans, però també nord-americans i cubans. Dit això, li cedeixo la paraula a la moderadora i moltes gràcies de nou per haver vingut. Molt bé, gràcies Josep, benvinguts a tots i a totes, gràcies per venir avui en aquesta sessió, diria jo que tan necessària, tinc la sensació que tots tenim moltes ganes de tractar aquests temes. Bé, aquest any ha sigut particularment singular, com sabeu tots, en els últims mesos hem tingut dos processos força inesperats, això ho podem discutir després, que indiquen uns canvis dràstics, de com està organitzat el món. Aquesta és la meva interpretació. Aleshores, el que podem plantejar-nos avui és una pregunta tan genèrica com i ara què? Què representa tant el Brexit com l'elecció a la presidència dels Estats Units del Donald Trump? I han posat en entredit, crec jo, que dues institucions, dos pilars que semblaven estables i d'alguna manera permanents, com són d'una banda la Unió Europea i de l'altra els Estats Units d'Amèrica i posen també en entredit la globalització, el procés de globalització, perquè són vots antisistema, d'alguna manera, això també ho podríem qüestionar. Bé, començarem la primera sessió parlant sobre el Brexit. Tenim aquí dos especialistes sobre el tema. Tenim a Joan Pau Rubies, que és professor i crea d'aquí de la Pompeu Fabra. Bé, tots coneixeu els professors que participaran en aquestes jornades, però els presentaré tal i com correspon. Com deia, el professor Rubies és Icarea de la Pompeu Fabra i té el doctorat de la Universitat de Cambridge i ha estat professor a numeroses institucions britàniques, per tant coneix molt bé el cas britànic, entre elles la London School of Economics, i és especialista en història moderna i en història de la globalització, per tant és un tema que domina força. I també tenim el professor Fernando Guirau, que és catedràtic Jean Monet d'Història, aquí també a la Pompeu Fabra, i té doctorat d'Història i Civilització a l'Institut Universitari Europeu de Florència, i és especialista en història econòmica europea, contemporània, i en història de la integració europea, que ara potser es convertirà en història de la desintegració europea, ens ho podríem plantejar. Bé, ja quasi bé callo i els hi cediré la paraula. El que farem és, cada un dels ponents parlarà entre 10 i 15 minuts amb les primeres impressions del Brexit i després obrirem el debat entre la taula i després el públic, si els hi sembla. Bé, jo, per llançar així una primera idea, la victòria del Brexit realment representa un challenge, no?, una un requestionament de la Unió Europea i ha sigut un dels cops més durs que ha rebut la institució i és el primer cop que un país membre decideix abandonar la Unió. Per tant, tots seran interrogants. Potser representa la desintegració de la Gran Bretanya, no ho sé, o de la Unió Europea, això són coses que ens podíem plantejar. Bé, ho deixo aquí, començarem amb el professor Rubies, així que li cedeixo la paraula i moltes gràcies als dos. Bé, Tal com ha indicat el professor Pic, qualsevol pregunta en castellà o en anglès posteriorment serà molt benvinguda. Jo sempre dono les classes en anglès a la Universitat Pompeu Fabra i avui aprofito l'oportunitat de parlar en català. A vegades ho trobo a faltar una mica també. Doncs bé, el Brexit 
ha estat un xoc per als britànics mateixos. Ni el David Cameron ni tan sols els Boris Johnson s'ho esperaven. I penso que, per tant, a part de les conseqüències que pugui tenir, val la pena preguntar-se per què ha passat i quines són les lliçons del Brexit. El títol de la meva xerrada és aquesta, les lliçons del Brexit. Començaré amb una repassada molt ràpida al que seria la sociologia del vot. Val a dir que la informació que tinc no és informació científica, sinó que es basa en les estimacions posteriors als diaris, medis de comunicació més informats. És a dir, no tenim encara una anàlisi sociològica detallada i profunda que s'hauria de fer. Ara bé, tenim uns indicadors bastant clars. Per tant, penso que es pot resumir en molt poques paraules. Van votar a favor del Brexit la gent gran, la gent de les províncies i de les zones rurals, la gent de les zones econòmicament més deprimides, la gent amb menys diners, és a dir, que guanyen menys al mes, i la gent menys educada. És a dir, la gent que se sent que la globalització els ha deixat enrere. I, a més a més, van votar pel Brexit les àrees ètnicament més homogènies d'Anglaterra i que se senten més identificats amb un patriotisme anglès-britànic. Dic anglès-britànic perquè és notable el fet que Brexit va fracassar tant a Escòcia com a Irlanda del Nord per raons diverses. O sigui, patriotisme de Sant George, podríem dir. Qui va votar per quedar-se a Europa? I no és poca gent, estem parlant d'un gairebé meitat a meitat, és 48%. Doncs, sobretot, la gent més jove, la gent que viu a les grans ciutats, sobretot a Londres, la gent més educada, la gent que viu a Oxford i Cambridge, i la gent que participa de l'economia més dinàmica, la gent que està més connectada, la gent que viu en zones ètnicament mixes i la gent cosmopolitana. Clarament tenim una sèrie d'indicadors bastant clars que hi ha unes raons clares. Quan es pregunta a la gent quina és la raó principal per la qual van votar pel Brexit, la raó número un és la immigració, és a dir, el rebuig del que ells han vist com un excés d'immigració. Hi ha altres raons, però aquesta seria la raó número un. No hi ha una lògica de partits excessivament forta. És veritat que més votants toris van votar per Brexit i més votants laboristes van votar per Remain, però moltes zones tradicionalment laboristes van votar per Brexit, sobretot les zones desindustrialitzades i deprimides. Les elits conservadores sempre han estat a favor de la Unió Europea per raons econòmiques, per raons a l'accés als mercats, i es van trobar que van perdre el control del procés. D'alguna manera, el David Cameron va fer un error de càlcul terrible sobretot perquè es va fiar de les enquestes. O sigui, hi ha lliçons de Brexit, lliçó número una, amb els referèndums no et fies les enquestes. A les accions, no gaire, però sobretot amb els referèndums, no et fies les enquestes. I finalment, el gran triomfador com a partit polític va ser UKIP, un partit que ningú no votaria mai al govern, perquè són una panda d'inútils, i la gent ho saben, i que a més a més, amb un lideratge completament completament esquinçat, tenen un personatge mediàtic que és el resum del populisme, diguéssim, que és Nigel Farage, que teníem en aquesta atractiva foto inicial. Doncs bé, el Nigel Farage ha obtingut un triomf espectacular servit en bandeja per David Cameron. Un home que no tenia cap possibilitat de governar ha aconseguit crear, posar la por al cos, no només als toris, sinó també als d'aigües. Perquè el fet del Brexit i com es va desenvolupar la campanya, en gran mesura responen a la capacitat d'un individu que tenia un sol diputat que no era ni el seu propi 
escó, el Parlament Britànic va aconseguir canviar l'agenda política. Això a mi em sembla una altra lliçó, diguéssim, que a vegades no cal estar al govern per dominar l'agenda política. Mai un home que tan poca gent hauria votat ha aconseguit, en una situació seriosa, ha aconseguit un impacte tan gran. Per mi em sembla que és un cas molt especial. Molt bé, llavors les lliçons quines serien? Ja he explicat que ha estat un gran error de càlcul de David Cameron. Molta gent diu que els referèndums es fan servir com a vots de protesta. Jo penso que en aquest cas no només hi va haver un vot de protesta, també hi havia una aspiració profunda que havia estat cultivada durant dècades. Penso que cal buscar causes profundes, no només a curt termini, per aquest no. I en aquest sentit cal començar per l'impacte mediàtic de dècades de propaganda negativa. Al Regne Unit, a Europa, són males notícies, des de fa 30 anys. No hi ha un discurs positiu, hi ha un discurs que pot ser més o menys negatiu. Però els que defensen Europa sempre ho fan com amb excuses. És a dir, no ens agrada, però és millor que. Ho necessitem. Econòmicament és útil. Sense la Unió Europea, Europa pot caure en nacionalismes competitius que poden crear inseguretat. És una solució a la Segona Guerra Mundial i a la Primera Guerra Mundial. És a dir, és una solució a una sèrie de dècades de conflicte europeu. Però, però, el que domina és, no ens agrada, és un problema, és una pèrdua de diners, és burocràcia, és una pèrdua de sobirania, és una pèrdua de control democràtic, és una imposició. Això és el discurs que ha dominat durant 30 anys. Llavors, d'alguna manera, l'estructura de la campanya va reflectir una càrrega profunda i sostinguda. Com es va plantejar la campanya? Bé, evidentment va ser molt complexa, no la puc resumir amb el temps que tinc, però sí que es pot dir una cosa important, que és que la gent que defensava el remeny tenia un discurs defensiu i molt poc engrescador. Venien a dir que cal sacrificar la democràcia barrejant el concepte de democràcia amb la sobirania, és a dir, cal sacrificar la sobirania identificada amb democràcia per tal d'aconseguir beneficis econòmics. Aquest és el gran argument que va liderar el remei. Hi havia gent que deia, no, no, és que es voten i ser cosmopolistes, està connectat, tal i qual, però aquest és el discurs minoritari. El discurs majoritari és hem de sacrificar la democràcia i la sobirania per aconseguir per aconseguir avantatges econòmics o per no perdre avantatges econòmics. Llavors, tu et planteges, tota aquesta gent que he descrit al principi que va votar el no, les zones rurals, les zones provincials, la gent sense educació, la gent amb problemes econòmics, la gent en dades desindustrialitzades, o els hi dius, heu de sacrificar la democràcia i la sobirania i el control de les fronteres a canvi d'uns beneficis econòmics que no teniu, i llavors què votaran? És a dir, que estava cantat, en el fons. Si no els hi dius, és que realment us convé, per moltes altres raons, però, evidentment, aquesta gent es trobaran amb que el Brexit tampoc els hi funciona. Però aquest serà el problema futur, diguéssim, el futur. Què fer amb el Brexit? Bé, llavors, què hem après sobre referèndums a partir del Brexit? Una cosa que hem après és que un referèndum tàctic, és a dir, un referèndum per treure de sobre un problema a base de càlculs tàctics, és un enorme perill. Jo no diré que els referèndums no siguin mai legítims. A vegades són necessaris. Sí, però, que penso que el Brexit demostra que un referèndum que divideix la població en dues meitats i que no ve acompanyada amb un discurs que pugui crear consens, pot crear més problemes que solucionar problemes. El gran repte de Teresa May ara no és només negociar, que serà una negociació molt difícil, perquè ha d'intentar aconseguir l'impossible de cara a Europa, és mantenir el mercat el màxim possible, però alhora mantenir el control 
de la immigració al màxim, és a dir, aquest és el gran debat que té Teresa May, el gran repte és com aconseguir allò que els europeus diuen que no pots tenir, que és separar l'accés al mercat comú amb la negació del dret a llibertat de moviment dels treballadors. Aquest és, diguéssim, el gran repte de Teresa May a nivell negociador, però el veritable repte polític és un altre, és com unificar el país. I serà molt difícil trobar una solució que no creï la sensació o bé que ha traït els que van votar Brexit o bé que ha deixat, que ha traït la gent jove, la gent cosmopolita, la gent econòmicament més connectada, els empresaris, les universitats. És a dir, que aquest és un repte realment molt profund. Llavors, jo acabaré, em sembla que he anat bastant de pressa, he complert amb el meu deure, que és no passar els 15 minuts, jo penso que acabaré dient que un referèndum útil, si es pogués generalitzar, i tothom té altres referèndums possibles en ment en aquests moments, un referèndum útil és aquell en el qual el referèndum és el resultat d'un procés polític que crea un consens. O un referèndum quan és absolutament impossible arribar a cap consens. És a dir, que l'alternativa és violència. Però, si hi pot haver-hi una fórmula de consens polític, un referèndum que divideix la població d'una manera molt profunda crea més problemes que no pas soluciona problemes. Aquest referèndum no era necessari. Aquesta és la gran tragèdia. Molt bé, moltes gràcies. Donem la paraula al professor Guirao i després preguntarem. Hola, bons dies a tots. Me llamo Fernando. El comentari inicial de Pau, de Joan, perdó, me ha hecho... De Joan Pau. Joan Pau. Uno no se equivoca nunca. En nombres compuestos uno no se equivoca nunca. Me ha hecho reflexionar sobre la lengua en la que utilizaremos... Y de pronto me he dado cuenta de que efectivamente lo que él dice tiene razón. Eh, yo llevo 25 años en la Pompeu y llevo 25 años hablando en catalán en los actos públicos. Y por lo tanto, como él ha marcado la pauta, si hubiera empezado yo, hubiera empezado en catalán, como él ha marcado la pauta, pues voy a tomar el lujo de seguir la misma pauta, que es hablar el idioma, mi, mi lengua materna, que es, el, que es el castellano. Por lo tanto, hablar en castellano, con lo cual tendremos pues, efectivamente en la práctica lo que es la política lingüística de esta universidad. Son tres idiomas utilizados indistintamente y sin ningún tipo de problemas. Um, yo soy historiador y yo llevo 35 años uh, estudiando la historia de la integración europea. La historia de la integración europea no es, como decía nuestra, nuestra moderadora, una historia en la cual eh, nosotros explicamos básicamente cómo los países se juntan para alcanzar algún tipo de meta. No. Y esto es uno de los grandes problemas que tenemos en la vida de la, de la integración europea. Es decir, hemos tenido un discurso teleológico que simplemente nos marca nuestras reflexiones, marca la manera en la cual miramos los asuntos europeos. Para los historiadores de la integración europea, el Brexit no es ningún drama. No es ningún drama. El Brexit era una cosa que formaba parte, formaba parte de lo que era el horizonte posible de la integración europea, porque la integración europea no es otra cosa más que encontrar soluciones colectivas para aquellos retos que los, que los Estados Nación consideran que no pueden resolver de manera aislada. Y por lo tanto lo que hacen es que encuentran soluciones comunes que en algunos casos estas soluciones comunes implican cesión de soberanía. Pero no siempre, no siempre. Y de hecho la Unión Europea en la actualidad tiene un núcleo de cesión de soberanía y la mayoría de las cosas que salen en los diarios hoy en día tienen que ver con simple cooperación intergubernamental. Pero la integración europea nace inicialmente con una transferencia de soberanía. Y la transferencia de soberanía es exactamente esto. La transferencia de soberanía es un acto político. Es un acto político que necesita el respaldo popular en la cual en un momento determinado un gobierno legítimamente, que detenta legítimamente unas atribuciones determinadas decide a través de sus sistemas constitucionales ceder parte de esa soberanía a unas instituciones comunes. Y la integración europea conlleva también la posibilidad de la desintegración europea. Porque en un momento determinado, esos mismos gobiernos, que son absolutamente legítimos, siguiendo mecanismos constitucionales propios, deciden que esa cesión de soberanía ya no se produce. 
Y por lo tanto, exactamente la misma legitimidad, la misma legitimidad tiene la cesión como la retrocesión. Así de simple. Y esto forma parte del, lo que podemos decir, del escenario de la integración europea. Solamente aquellos que consideran que la integración europea es una historia feliz, donde vamos todos hacia los Estados Unidos de Europa, la Federación Europea, yo que sé qué, consideran todo esto como un drama. Y de hecho, Europa en la actualidad se divide entre aquellos que ven el Brexit un drama, aquellos que ven el Brexit como una oportunidad. Yo veo el Brexit exactamente como esto, veo el Brexit como un hecho dado, sobre el cual no hay que dramatizar, sobre el cual no podemos utilizar de alguna manera... <coughs> En situaciones muy, muy, muy conflictivas como estas hay que mantener siempre la cabeza muy fría, siempre la cabeza muy fría. Y por lo tanto yo quisiera, de alguna manera, en mi exposición actual, combatir una idea. Y la idea es fundamentalmente que estamos mejor sin los británicos. Es una idea muy extendida. Los británicos, como ha explicado Jean Pau, de alguna manera han sido unos socios antipáticos desde el principio y por lo tanto estamos mejor sin ellos. Es una equivocación garrafal, garrafal. Y una parte de la solución del Brexit, una parte de lo que podría ser la respuesta colectiva contra los populismos, seguramente la respuesta será la equivocada. Seguramente será la equivocada. Y lo que haremos es acentuar aún más el populismo. Por lo tanto, lo primero que tenemos que entender es que es absolutamente legítimo. Cuando el voto nos favorece, cuando el voto es aquello que nosotros esperamos que sea, Nadie discute la calidad de ese voto. Nadie discute si ese votante es instruido o no es instruido. Si ese votante es educado o no es educado. Cuando el voto nos conviene, el votante nos conviene. Nos gusta. Cuando el voto no nos conviene, hay un elemento justificativo que tiende a decir que, claro, esos votantes se han equivocado. Yo recuerdo perfectamente en las últimas elecciones generales, que lidera Podemos en Galicia, vino a decir que los votantes gallegos no sabían lo que querían. Porque, ¿cómo era posible que votaran PP y no votaran Podemos? Bueno, es un problema. La democracia, como decía Churchill, cuando, cuando votas, cuando hablas con el votante medio, la odias. La democracia es esto. Por lo tanto, lo primero que tenemos que hacer es Intentar eliminar ese tipo de, de, de análisis, que son análisis que no nos ayudan en absoluto. Porque lo que hay, y lo que tenemos que entender que hay en Estados Unidos, que hay aquí, que hay en Inglaterra, que hay en Francia, que hay en Italia, y que hay en la China con Chinchina, es básicamente todo un segmento de población absolutamente decepcionada. Decepcionada porque aquellos réditos que, le, que teóricamente la globalización tendría que producir y que está produciendo, desde hace 25 años se distribuyen mal. La diferencia fundamental entre el crecimiento económico hasta hace 25 años y el crecimiento económico a partir de los últimos 25 años es básicamente la capacidad de distribución de esa riqueza. Esa riqueza se, se redistribuía de una manera más equitativa de cuanto sucede ahora. Y lo que sucede ahora es que hay grupos de población que desde hace 20, 25 años se sienten, se perciben perdedores. Y lo son, no es que se perciban, es que lo son, es que lo son de verdad. Es que las condiciones de vida de una parte de la población, aquella que estaba más vinculada a la, a la economía real, se ha estancado en los últimos 20, 25 años. Y en un momento determinado se forman coaliciones que permiten cambiar las reglas del juego. Por tanto, lo que tenemos es un elemento de, de crítica sistémica a un modo de hacer las cosas. Y esto es esto simplemente lo que tenemos que hacer es... Entender que esto está pasando y, por lo tanto, tenemos que ser capaces de implementar las políticas necesarias para revertirlo. Punto número uno. Punto número dos. Inglaterra, Gran Bretaña, ha sido un socio extraordinario en la integración europea. Es el país que más ha contribuido a, a formar la Unión Europea en la actualidad. Tenemos 15, de alguna manera, contribuciones por parte de Inglaterra. La primera de ellas tiene que ver el sistema de recursos propios, solo Gracias a la adhesión, a la incorporación de Inglaterra, la Unión Europea se dota del elemento que lo hace diferen, que la diferencia del conjunto de las organizaciones internacionales, que es los recursos propios. La, la Comunidad Europea, la Unión Europea, tiene recursos propios, no tiene recursos cedidos, como pueden tener los demás países. 
las, Naciones, las Naciones Unidas, la OTAN, lo que ustedes quieran, lo que dependen son de las contribuciones nacionales. Entonces, un país, Estados Unidos, de pronto dice, mire usted, como a mí no me gusta lo que hace Kofi Annan, voy a no pagar mi, la cuota que corresponde a las Naciones Unidas y condicionan la política de las Naciones Unidas. Aquí no. Aquí la Unión Europea y la Comunidad Europea tienen recursos que son propios y, por lo tanto, tiene autonomía para llevar a cabo aquello que son sus atribuciones particulares. Esto se debe a Gran Bretaña. Es la adhesión de Gran Bretaña lo que permite a la Comunidad Europea, entonces, a, eh, adquirir el sistema de recursos propios, que es el sistema que permite la financiación permanente de la Comunidad Europea y la financiación permanente de las políticas comunitarias. En segundo lugar, la incorporación de Gran Bretaña hace de la Comunidad Europea aquello que es lo más importante, que es el bloque comercial más importante del mundo. Sin Gran Bretaña, la Comunidad Europea no lo sería. En tercer lugar, lo que hace es que, gracias a los británicos, tenemos el mercado único europeo. El mercado único europeo es un proyecto de Margaret Thatcher, es un proyecto liderado por Lord Corfield, que es el que lleva, que es el comisario del mercado único, que es el que va a llevar a cabo todo el programa de mercado único europeo. El mercado único europeo es el activo más importante de la Unión Europea. No hay otro activo en la Unión Europea, otro activo, no hay otro activo que no esté sujeto a discusión. Cualquier otro elemento de la Unión Europea, el que sea, siempre hay alguien que lo discute. Cualquier otra política comunitaria, cualquier institución comunitaria, cualquier elemento vinculado con la Unión Europea está sujeto a crítica y a discusión con la excepción del mercado único. El mercado único es producto británico. Es gracias a Margaret Thatcher, tan denostada en nuestras tierras, obviamente, Margaret Thatcher y gracias a Lord Cotfield. No, a, Jean, no a, a, a Jack Delors, sino a Lord Cotfield. Por otra parte, lo que tenemos es que gracias a la diplomacia británica, la política exterior común de la, de la Comunidad Europea se sustenta fundamentalmente en los diplomáticos británicos. Cualquier capacidad defensiva europea dentro o fuera de la Unión Europea solo puede gestionarse a través de la contribución militar británica. Solo los británicos tienen capacidad militar para gestionar un tipo de política defensiva común. Francia, como sabéis, la tiene perfectamente ocupada en sus ex-colonias y Alemania es un enano político desde el punto de vista militar. Por lo tanto, no hay otra capacidad. Inglaterra concede lo que es la lengua franca. La lengua franca de la Unión Europea es el inglés. Y si siguiéramos textualmente los, los, los preceptos constitucionales, la salida de Gran Bretaña significaría que tendríamos una batalla lingüística. Porque o tendríamos una lengua que no es oficial de la Unión Europea o tendríamos que pelearnos contra... El... En Irlanda es oficial también. Es cooficial. Sí, pero es cooficial. Sí, pero, es co... pero sí. Perdona, tiene razón. Pero el problema que tenemos es que los irlandeses presentaron el gaélico como la lengua comunitaria. ¿Por qué? Porque tenían el inglés por Gran Bretaña. Y esto está en el tratado de, tratado de adhesión de Gran Bretaña. No lo puedes cambiar. Tendrías que renegociarlo. Y para renegociar esto, si, y, si, si Irlanda quisiera renegociar esto, podríamos renegociar también la política fiscal de Irlanda, que es excepcional. Uh, Inglaterra también uh, contribuye a todo lo que son las grandes, las, las principales instituciones académicas que nosotros podemos contar, están accesibles a todos nosotros en igualdad de condiciones. Y por otra parte, lo que tenemos es que los británicos son de las grandes potencias de la Unión Europea, son los únicos que implementan regularmente todo el acervo comunitario. Son los que tienen menos recursos en el Tribunal, en el tribunal de Justicia. Es decir, los ingleses protestan mucho, 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 mucho. Preguntan, preguntan, ¿y por qué, por qué, por qué, por qué, por qué? Pero una vez que acuerdan, lo implementan. Nosotros no preguntamos. Acordamos y no implementamos. Bueno, es que hay, hay, hay europeísmo de diversas características. El británico es el que a mí me gusta. El británico es el que pregunta por qué. ¿Por qué? ¿Lo habéis pensado bien? ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? Y una vez que están convencidos y se aprueba, lo implementan. ¿Nosotros qué hacemos? Más Europa, más Europa, más Europa, si sabéis exactamente qué quiere decir, y una vez que lo tenemos, luego no lo implementamos. O lo implementamos a medias, o cualquiera sabe. España es, uno de los, es el país que tiene más incumplimientos en la aplicación de las directivas y de los reglamentos comunitarios. Es un desastre de llevar en Y por otra parte... Los británicos tienen, el gobierno británico tiene un elemento que es fundamental, que es que simplemente clarifica, clarifica las cosas. Y os voy a poner un ejemplo. Mirad, cuando se hace el acuerdo especial de, hacia Gran Bretaña, aquel que se hace en febrero 
del 2016, es el acuerdo del Consejo Europeo, hay en primer lugar lo que es un draft, es un primer borrador, y hay lo que es el acuerdo definitivo. El borrador es del 2 de febrero, el acuerdo definitivo es del 16-17 de febrero. El, el borrador dice lo siguiente, en relación a lo que es la unión, la unión uh, cada vez más, la, uh, a, a, a Never Closer Union, que es esta cláusula que forma parte del acervo comunitario, a la Never Closer Union, union los ingleses dicen, oiga, ¿esto qué significa? Dice Cameron, le dice a sus colegas, an ever closer union, ¿esto qué significa? ¿Qué implicaciones tiene? Entonces, en la primera de los borradores, aquella que se hace de manera genuina, se establece una cosa muy sencillita. Dice, an ever closer union es básicamente un compromiso permanente de colaboración entre los, todos los pueblos democráticos de los países europeos. Bueno, es, es bonito. Es decir, ella decía que la integración europea debía de ser alguna cosa como, no, no nos ponemos nada de acuerdo. Es decir, tú coges a los daneses, coges a los suecos, a los españoles y los portugueses y le dices qué quiere decir a Never Close a Union y cada uno sale por patineras. Cada uno dice lo que le da la gana y no coincidiríamos. Por lo tanto, nunca lo definimos. ¿Por qué? Porque era mejor dejarlo así. Era mejor no definirlo, porque si tuviéramos que definirlo, no lo definiríamos. Y en este momento se hace una definición sui generis. Y la definición sui generis es básicamente a Never Close a Union significa un espíritu permanente de colaboración entre todos los pueblos democráticos de Europa. ¿Verdad que sí? Suena bonito. Venga, eso es el 2 de febrero. En, la, en el acuerdo definitivo del 16 de febrero, lo que se establece es que Never Close Union dice, lo que dice el acuerdo es, Never Close Union no es A, no es B, no es C, no es D, no es E y no es F. Y no hay ni un solo gobierno europeo, ni uno solo de los 27, que sea capaz de introducir qué es a Never Closer Union. Por lo tanto, tenemos un problema los europeos. Los europeos tenemos un problema y es que, claro, queremos de alguna manera, y es uno de los problemas que tiene el Brexit en la actualidad, de alguna manera lo que queremos es retener a un grupo de, de países, de, de poblaciones democráticas, dentro de algo que no sabemos bien qué quiere decir, ni sabemos bien qué quiere hacer, ni sabemos bien por qué lo queremos construir. Y este problema de indefinición es un problema que empieza a tener... Este tipo de impactos. Vayamos al Brexit. ¿Qué podemos hacer con el Brexit? Eh, Joan Pau decía que, que uno de los problemas de, 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 de Theresa May es que vamos a hacer ahora con el Brexit. Bueno, eh, nos equivocaremos, obviamente, porque llevamos 25 años equivocándonos. Es decir, la Unión Europea lleva 25 años de equivocaciones, una detrás de otra. 25 años. Algunas de ellas no cometidas por los británicos, como sabemos perfectamente. Y, por lo tanto, ¿qué podemos hacer? Pues hay una solución muy sencilla. Sencillísima. Sencillísima que es dejar las cosas como están. Porque Gran Bretaña tiene un Brexit en la actualidad. Gran Bretaña tiene todo un conjunto de exenciones, protocolos y eh, eh, situaciones especiales que la excluye de todo aquello que le resulta antipático. Todo. De todo, de todo lo que le resulta antipático. Por lo tanto, podemos perfectamente mantener la situación actual, simplemente lo ponemos negro sobre blanco, y decimos, Brexit means Brexit, con todas las excepciones, añadiendo, añadiendo, obviamente, la salida, la salida de Gran Bretaña de, todos los, de todas las instituciones, es decir, el vacío institucional. Si nosotros mantenemos el Brexit, la, la situación de Gran Bretaña exactamente igual que está, exactamente igual que está, cogemos a todas las instituciones y las vaciamos de británicos. Juan, si no es una lástima. La vaciamos de británicos. Sí, lo sé. La vaciamos de... Acabo enseguida. Lo vaciamos de británicos. Y lo único que hacemos es la libre circulación de personas, que es uno de los elementos fundamentales, porque el mercado único son cuatro libertades y una de ellas es la libre circulación de personas. Las cuatro libertades, las cuatro libertades están, sujetas, están sujetas a una serie de elementos. Todas ellas pueden suspenderse, todas ellas legalmente pueden suspenderse en casos de emergencia. De salud, por problemas de salud nacional, de defensa nacional, emergencia nacional. Hay una serie de elementos que permiten lo que es, de alguna manera, la suspensión de las libertades. Podríamos perfectamente hacer que la suspensión de la libertad de libre circulación de personas, pudiéramos perfectamente esto, que es una cosa que es una nota a pie de página, lo podríamos sacar de la nota a pie de página, lo podríamos colocar al principio, de manera que Londres tendría la autoridad de suspender la libre circulación de personas, en el caso que Londres y los británicos lo consideraran que, de alguna manera, pone en peligro lo que vosotros queráis. Esto sería completamente legal. Completamente legal. Pero tenemos un problema. Y el problema fundamental es que la Unión Europea 
se gestiona vía Twitter. La Unión Europea se gestiona vía Twitter. ¿Cómo explicamos esto a la población? No lo podemos hacer. Por lo tanto, nuestros líderes políticos intentarán de alguna manera hacer lo que siempre han hecho. Es decir, gestionar la Unión Europea mirando hacia atrás, mirando hacia su electorado. Y esto formará parte y es una de las causas en las cuales explican el, uh, explican el Brexit y pueden explicar el gra grado de desafección que tenemos en muchos países en relación a la Unión Europea. Por lo tanto, ¿qué quiero decir con esto? Quiero decir es que efectivamente hay un problema, Gran Bretaña lo que ha hecho es como siempre, pone en evidencia lo que es un problema fundamental y es el problema que nosotros no, eh, tenemos que ser capaces de interiorizar y, ten, y necesitamos interiorizar lo que es que la Unión Europea puede desintegrarse, puede desintegrarse, puede desintegrarse, Gran Bretaña lo pone sobre la, la taula, sobre la mesa, nos obliga a tener que redefinir de alguna manera buena parte de las políticas y buena parte de los objetivos de la, de la Unión Europea y luego, por otra parte, tendríamos que entender que Brexit puede ser una oportunidad, una oportunidad y quizás la última, de hacer una Europa mucho más inclusiva, mucho más democrática, mucho más que interese fundamentalmente a la mayoría de la población y no solamente a una parte de la población. Gracias. Bien, muchas gracias, profesor Guirao. Eh, dos intervenciones fantásticas porque nos dan dos perspectivas eh, muy diferentes, con lo cual es perfecto para, para el debate, mientras que Rubíes eh, afirmaba literalmente que el Brexit no era necesario por todas las repercusiones. Eh, Guirao pues, eh, desdramatiza eh, el análisis del Brexit. Uh, por tanto, yo creo que empezaríamos por... Eh, no sé si el profesor Rubíes tiene respuestas por alusiones obvias... Eh, bueno, yo, yo pienso que um, um, eh, respecto a esto, se, se, bueno, el doctor en el catalán, de fet, um, hi ha, hi ha, hi ha dos, dos consecuencias, evidentemente, diferentes del Brexit. Una es la interna, por el Reino Unido, que es el punto de vista que yo he adoptado en la meva intervención como semiciudadano, que soy, amb una dona y familia que son británicos, y la otra es la perspectiva externa, desde el punto de vista de quines, quines implicaciones tiene para Europa. Evidentemente, estoy de acuerdo con el Fernando, que representa un perill y una oportunidad para Europa, el que está pasando. Desde el punto de vista británico, pienso que está tracta de minimizar daños en estos momentos. Es decir, no veo, no veo un beneficio posible. Y veo daños enormes o daños menos enormes. Esta es la situación que veo. Um, per... el, 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 el... A nivel económico, el Brexit significará mayores déficits y menos inversión. Un, una pérdida inicial de potencial de crecimiento. A corto termini no han visto esto. Eh? Es decir, los catastrofistas que pensaban que en 10 minutos y habría un colapso de la economía británica, donde se han visto desmentidos. Y ha habido, pero, una, una pérdida clara de, 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 de nivel de la lliura, bastante substancial, respecto al euro y al dólar, que es una pérdida que tiene también efectos positivos, eh? no es puramente negativo, también puede aumentar la compatibilidad de la economía británica a corto termini. Ahora bien, el que sí es cierto es que según cómo es negocia, según cómo es trigui a llegar a un acuerdo. Y según el tipo de ambiente que se crea durante las negociaciones, los costos pueden ser bastante elevados. Y un otro tema importante, que es respecto a la inmigración, es que yo pienso que a, 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 a la economía y la sociedad británica les convé un nivel de inmigración por ser no tan alto como el han tenido los últimos años, pero bastantes. Més els han anat bé. En, en, en tenen los hospitales plenos de gente de fuera, las universidades plenas de gente de fuera, una capacidad de, de, de fer que las universidades no només es fundin en fondos europeos, sino que, a més a més, a, 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 puguin tener muchos estudiantes internacionales. Todo esto no es només porque son... Oxford y Cambridge, universidades británicas, es porque son universidades muy globalizadas, con conexiones, fan de pont entre Estados Unidos y Europa a nivel académico. Es decir, la posición privilegiada que tiene la universidad inglesa es resentirá del Brexit 
i a no ser que facin excepcions. És a dir, que han de crear excepcions a nivell d'indústries concretes, a nivell d'hospitals, a nivell d'universitats. Dit d'una altra manera, no els convé tancar les fronteres. Per tant, el guany que puguin obtenir de tancar les fronteres és un guany de relatiu, és un guany molt relatiu. I, en canvi, els perills que puguin tenir són enormes. Jo penso que des del punt de vista britànic és una lose-lose situation, però en què realment evidentment no són tontos i intentaran buscar la solució que faci, que creï menys danys, però bàsicament els avantatges no els veig per enlloc. No, no, és que, a veure, el tema està, no és que això tingui o no tingui avantatges, el tema està en que això ha passat, ha passat, és un fet. Aleshores el que hem de fer ara és intentar d'alguna manera aprofitar el fet per millorar tots plegats. I una de les coses que hem de fer per fer això, bàsicament, és treure tot allò que són aquestes concepcions errònies que tenim uns dels altres. I hem d'evitar tot això de manera que puguem, d'alguna manera, anar per business. Aleshores, en aquest anar per business és un interès col·lectiu tocar el menys possible. I l'únic element que cal tocar, l'únic element que cal tocar, l'únic element que és conflictiu, perquè per la resta no hi ha conflicte, si vosaltres llegiu que és interessantíssim el que és l'informe oficial sobre el que és les alternatives al membership, que és un informe oficial aprovat pel Parlament Britànic, si llegiu la pàgina, quina pàgina serà aquesta? No està paginat, crec que és la pàgina 3. Si llegiu la pàgina 3 i li canvieu el títol, això podria ser Brexit means Brexit. I està explicant la situació britànica en l'actualitat. Si tu agafes exactament aquesta pàgina, i li canvies el text i poses Brexit means Brexit, aquests que han votat Brexit diran, oh, que bé, fantàstic, això és el que jo volia. Això és el que jo volia. Alguna diferència, que has de treure el que és una línia que diu, i a part d'això, nois, a part d'això, estem asseguts a l'altra taula i decidim el que ens convé, el que ens convé, i fem el que ens dona la gana. Asseguts a la taula. Aquesta frase l'has de treure. I us està molt bé, però ja no està assegut a la taula. Aleshores, què hem de fer? No empillorar les coses. I com no empillorem les coses? Si nosaltres estem convençuts que això ha sigut un error, si nosaltres estem convençuts que la Unió Europea mereix la pena, si nosaltres estem convençuts que els anglesos haurien d'estar amb nosaltres, els britànics haurien d'estar amb nosaltres, el que hem de fer és no empillorar les coses. I per no empillorar les coses el que hauríem de fer és, d'alguna manera, donar l'oportunitat durant 10 anys, per exemple, un període transitori de 10 anys, en el qual tu no toques absolutament res, tothom surt de les institucions, deixes els britànics que fas que aquesta nota a peu de pàgina vagi al text principal, no toca res, de manera que els anglesos puguin tenir ja d'aquí a deu anys una visió molt més, molt més real, realista, de quina és la seva situació de la Unió Europea, quines són les ventalles o inconvenients. I que d'aquí a deu anys tu li pots dir, escolta, deu anys, torneu amb el vostre sistema constitucional, ja sigui el Parlament, ja sigui a través d'un referèndum, i ja decidiu definitivament què voleu. I aleshores, en aquest moment específic, nosaltres ja podem decidir que aleshores el Regne Unit ha de sortir absolutament de tots els mecanismes. Però és completament ridícul, perquè formant part del mercat únic hi ha un munt de països que no tenen res a veure amb la Unió Europea, que no són membres de la Unió Europea. Per què la Terra no podia ser membre de la Unió Europea? És que no té sentit. És que la Unió Europea no són les seves institucions. I el mercat únic és un mercat que no està limitat a la Unió Europea, és un mercat únic que s'amplia, que s'amplia. Turquia forma part del mercat únic, Turquia forma part del mercat únic, Turquia, Turquia forma part del mercat únic sense la lliure circulació de persones. Per tant, hi ha moltes maneres de fer-lo. L'única cosa és que si nosaltres el que volem fer és lliçons morals, si el que volem fer és lliçons morals, que és el que Europa està fent des de fa deu anys, aleshores, clar, quan... Si entres con la moralitat ja les coses són més complicades, perquè, clar, Dios lo ve todo. I, clar, és complicat. Però si deixem aquestes coses i agafem el que és la Unió Europea a través del que és el seu sentit original i únic, que és bàsicament un instrument que serveix per recolzar aquelles polítiques que els estats decideixen, que són aquelles que li donen més garantia de recolzament popular, aquelles que donen més capacitat de gestió per solucionar els problemes que afecten a la seva població, si som capaços de tornar a la idea original, aleshores el Brexit seria una oportunitat. I d'aquesta manera, Anglaterra o el Regne Unit tornaria a la Unió Europea d'aquí a deu anys en ple convenciment. Bé, ja ho hauríem millorat. Per tant, bé, és aquí. És cert que s'està parlant 
d'una fase transicional per guanyar temps. Això se n'està parlant fins i tot alguns hard brexiters veuen la dificultat d'una ruptura ràpida. Però bueno, jo no tinc tantes il·lusions. Bueno, és una perspectiva més pragmàtica i des de llavors seria optimista, diria jo, però sí, sí, des de llavors no. És un moment d'oportunitat, es pot llegir com a tal. Bé, tenim uns deu minutets i el que farem serà oblir preguntes al públic, perquè penso que per això heu vingut en part. Per tant, hi ha una pregunta allà al fons. Hola, moltes gràcies a tots. Trobo que les dues xerrades han estat molt suggerents i per això em veig amb cor també de dir alguna cosa, perquè crec que arran del que s'ha dit hi ha com a mínim dues coses que jo volia comentar. I una, suposo que són frases que ha dit el professor Guirao, el que admiro moltíssim, i que ha dit una cosa, primer, clar, que la integració comporta la possibilitat de desintegració. Jo estic absolutament d'acord, però no ha estat així fins ara. Fins ara el que hi havia hagut era una integració que comportava una possibilitat de desintegració gairebé exante, perquè eren els mateixos tractats en els quals hi havia les excepcions, o millor dit, els diferents nivells d'integració per part dels estats. Llavors això jo crec que és una novetat a la qual ens enfrontem ara, com a mínim. I l'altra cosa era, en relació a la aposta que ell fa, sobretot ens ha fet al final, que és més... Això, suggerent, és que no se m'acudeix una altra paraula, sobre la possibilitat que el Regne Unit decideixi voluntàriament, o sigui, ell mateix, aquest estat mateix, dins del seu propi sistema de presa de decisions, la suspensió de la lliure circulació de persones. Esclar, a mi em sembla que legalment això és possible, legalment això seria una interpretació, crec jo, una mica forçada a la norma, però entenc que es pot fer, perquè la norma en principi preveu aquestes suspensions per un període de temps molt més limitat que el que estem plantejant aquí, però fins i tot si forcem la norma fins a aquest punt i permetem, o es permet això, i per tant això és possible, jo el que em pregunto és llavors quan tardarà qualsevol altre estat que ara mateix també es veu amb una pressió forta o que percep com a forta a demanar el mateix i llavors fins a quin punt la Unió Europea és viable amb un mercat únic sense lliure circulació de persones o sense lliure circulació de persones per molts més estats que no pas, sí, ja ho sé, el Regne Unit, Suïssa, perquè també estem plantejant això, Turquia, però tota la resta o molts dels altres que formen part de la Unió Europea fins ara 28 i potser ara 27 i mig o 27. Gràcies. Això són molt senzilles. No és la primera vegada que això ha passat. A Groenlàndia va sortir de la Comunitat Europea en el seu moment. A Noruega va signar un tractat d'adhesió i a través de referèndum van rebutjar entrada. Suïssa va decidir en un moment específic obrir negociacions i després tancar negociacions. Per tant, el problema que tenim nosaltres és que hem tingut una visió teleològica. I en aquesta visió teleològica, què passava? Si vosaltres us recordeu dels vostres llibres de text, el que nosaltres estudiàvem era la successió d'adhesions. Primer eren 6, després van ser 9, després van ser 10, 12, 15... Us recordeu d'això? I nosaltres sempre estudiàvem això. Per què? Perquè això està marcant la nostra visió. I mai es plantejàvem, mai, per què els més rics queden fora. Per què Suïssa no és membre de la Unió Europea? Per què Noruega no és membre de la Unió Europea? Per què Islàndia no és membre de la Unió Europea? Per què alguns queden fora? Aquesta és una pregunta interessantíssima. Perquè aquesta pregunta explica molt més sobre la Unió Europea molt més que la successió d'adhesions. Per tant, en aquesta visió que tu dius, és aquesta visió teleològica que no podem més que anar en una direcció. No, es pot anar en una direcció i en la seva contrària. Podem anar en una direcció i en la contrària. I això ho portem dient 20 anys. El que passa és que, clar, la història d'integració europea, encara la pressió dels mitjans de comunicació, d'aquests que fan d'historiadors que no són historiadors i que expliquen la història d'integració europea d'una certa manera, perquè jo hi era, jo hi era i per tant jo sé què va passar allà, això és una cosa molt habitual, i per tant tenim una visió totalment distorsionada. La integració europea és un fenomen per nosaltres totalment ahistòric. Està encara, encara està en el nivell mitològic. Encara està en el nivell mitològic, encara no ha baixat del nivell mitològic. Per tant, les visions històriques, que són aquelles que ajuden a solucionar problemes, perquè estic completament convençut que els historiadors solucionem problemes, a diferència d'altres disciplines, que té una especialitat molt gran de generar problemes, perquè després ja són els especialistes per resoldre aquests problemes, els historiadors no. Els historiadors són capaços de resoldre problemes. Per tant, aquesta és la resposta a la primera pregunta. Ja havia passat. I ens hauríem d'haver preparat. 
El que no podemos hacer es que un nivel de desafección para la Unión Europea que, es que va arribar a ser espectacular no para atención a eso. Y uno no, es que, que es un proyecto estupendo. Y por tanto, hemos de pasar por aquí, no. Y el segundo error es intentar hacer a Inglaterra una lliçó moral, para espantar a la resta. Porque a mí me agradaría una Unión Europea más cohesionada. Yo voy a una Unión Europea más cohesionada. A mí no, a mí no me importaría ahora usar la zafada vermella para que todos aquellos que quieran surtir, surtiesen de más. Yo no tendría que haber nada de problema. Que surtiesen de más, que, que surtiesen de más. De manera que la Unión Europea pueda operar de una manera muy más cohesionada, muy más coherente. Y eso no puede continuar en la situación en la que esté. Por tanto, todos aquellos que quieran surtir, que surtiesen. Y después, yo no estoy bien que tú le dones a los británicos la posibilidad de sus el FED de suspender la ley de circulación de personas. No, si es que no hubo un fe. No tienen capa intención de hacerlo. Pero tanto, lo que tú les de donar es la posibilidad de... La posibilidad de... Agafas a este, que tú digas a este de página y lo pones en el, el texto principal. Londres podrá tancar la seta si eso es necesario. Se acabó. Es la posibilidad de... De hacer eso. El que la, que la gente que ha votado el Brexit necesita. Y es el que Teresa May necesita, pero el que necesita es, es posarlo como categoría principal, no como categoría, como, te, como, como, como peo de página, pero por tal de convencer a la seva población. Por tanto, no es tracta de fe que eso sigue la situación normal durante 10 años. No, en absoluto. Eso no habría de pasar. Y si pasa es, ya habría mecanismos de presión para evitar que eso continúe eh, pasando. Pero el que necesitas es tener las cosas claras, si no es un lío impresionante, que es el que tenemos ahora, hoy en día. Hoy en día el que tenemos es un lío impresionante. Un caso muy concreto, muy puntual. De fet, como sabeu, David Cameron va negociar amb Europa precisamente sobre aquel punto. Y le van dar una mica de flexibilidad. El problema va ser que él había calculado que amb això aconseguiría el suport popular para continuar en Europa y podría enterrar para siempre UKIP y la gente que vive de sortir de Europa para que todos los planes de Europa. Pero no le van a dar tan como volía. Eh? O sea, eso que tú dices que el gusto es el problema es lo que de fet va negociar David Cameron. Y lo que la gente ha rebutjat. Es decir, a la campaña eso va a desaparecer. Va a desaparecer completamente. Porque eso es una cosa que a nivel de leads puede funcionar. Pero a nivel del discurso popular, y que entra en el plano del populismo, cuando se entra en la dinámica de un referéndum, a la gente no se va a decir, y es que en el fondo ya tenemos un, un, una capacidad de control cuando nos conviene. No, no, se iban a decir. Pues que eso no lo tenía, David Cameron. En el, en el sí, en la negociación, sí. Van, van a hacer una negociación. Van... Pero no lo tenía yo en el acuerdo. En el acuerdo lo que tenía era una cosa completamente diferente, que tenía que ver con el que tenía que ver con todo lo que era la política de reagrupamiento familiar y tenía que ver con los beneficios sociales que podías aportar, la división de personas implica eso, de las dependencias de los de inmigrantes europeos que van a calcular y eso era, era el chocolate del oro. O van a calcular, eran uh, 3 millones de euros, sí, sí. o 3 millones de euros esterlinas al año, una cosa de estas. Eh, gracias por estas contribuciones. Yo eh, quería dirigirme al, a, a la mesa con una actitud algo más eh, crítica, en el sentido de que eh, deberíamos volver al tema del populismo, según mí, eh, y... Eh, tal vez preguntarnos si, por ejemplo, la manera en que hemos estado discutiendo el Brexit como representando una manifestación de una inteligencia, voluntad gubernamental, eh, si esto no es discutible, si de hecho eh, las consultas, los referendos, los cuales hemos visto ya varios ejemplos, en Hungría uno en contra del de derecho de la Unión Europea de imponerles eh, cuotas de, de, de refugiados, por ejemplo, ¿no? Si el instrumento del referéndum se ha ya desvinculado de la inteligencia política y se ha convertido en un fenómeno eh, eh, que se in, incierte en un, en un mecanismo propio, que ya, no, que ya no responde a una inteligencia política. Eh, ¿Cuál mecanismo podría ser este? ¿Por qué ocurre ahora, en este momento en la historia de la Unión Europea, eh, ¿Por qué ocurre el referéndum eh, con tema de separación, con tema de eh, desvinculación? ¿Y eh, de qué modo podemos entender eh, esta concentración de referéndums que tenemos ahora desde el punto de vista del de hecho de que la política en su discurso, en su actuación, eh, frecuenta más los métodos populistas? 
de, por lo menos esa es una percepción que tengo, no sé si es correcta, pero hay un vínculo entre los dos. ¿Y cuál es este vínculo? Y eh, no deberíamos tal vez abandonar la idea de que hay una inteligencia política detrás del de referéndum. Mi respuesta a esto sería básicamente que lo que es está, el referéndum siempre se han utilizado en Europa. Uh, en temas vinculados con integración europea ha habido 17 referéndums. Lo que sucede es que todos han salido bien, todos, menos algunos, que tienen que ver con menos algunos, y, y se han vuelto a hacer otra vez y se ha acabado, punto, ya está, se ha acabado. ¿Por qué? Porque eran países a los cuales le podía simplemente decir, bueno, a ver, ¿qué es lo que pasa? Sucede esto y esto, lo resolvemos, se lo damos y se acabó. Que es el caso que tenemos aquí, es un caso muy similar. Es decir, si eres capaz de identificar exactamente cuál es la causa profunda, solucionemos esa causa profunda y a otra cosa mariposa. Uh, tenemos que hacer esto. Lo que pasa es que Gran Bretaña no es, no es Dinamarca, no es Irlanda. Sí, Gran Bretaña es, otro, es otra cosa, es otro cantar. Por eso es mucho más complicado todo este tema. Y luego lo que tenemos que pensar es que fundamentalmente el populismo, el populismo que es un fenómeno que siempre ha existido, es, es lo, que, lo, que, lo que diferencia la situación actual de otras situaciones anteriores, es básicamente su, su dimensión, es decir, la, la, la dimensión y cómo se está vehiculizando a través de alternativas políticas concretas, cosa que antes no estaba. Estaban mucho más difuminados, no estaban bien estructurados, las nuevas tecnologías han ayudado a estructurar esto, la segmentación o la fragmentación de lo que es la información política o la información ha hecho que efectivamente cada uno se quede en su, en su capilla y, y se está autoalimentando auto, auto de, sus propias, de sus propias tonterías. Esto está sucediendo, pero bueno, lo que, lo que ha pasado ahora, lo que está pasando ahora, que es una cosa realmente interesantísima, es que se está produciendo un deterioro muy significativo del sistema político en cuanto a la respuesta de aquello que interesa a la mayoría de las poblaciones. Y esto es un fenómeno que es un fenómeno relativamente nuevo. Es decir, hasta, hasta finales de la década de los años 70, mediados de la década de los años 80, de alguna manera la mayoría de las poblaciones se sentían representadas por buena parte de las políticas que adoptaban los, estos, estos gobiernos. Ahora no sucede esto. Y esto tiene que ver fundamentalmente con, la fin, la, con lo que es toda la que es la finalización de la, de la economía. Es decir, una economía que ha pasado de la economía real a la economía financiera hace que de alguna manera los, la distribución... Y, y cómo, y cómo, fíjate tú, lo que es la economía financiera es curiosísima. La economía financiera requiere un, un, un segmento muy específico de la población, unas cualificaciones muy específicas, por lo tanto no son reciclables aquellos que salen de la construcción o de la industria automovilística, pero es una industria que además no paga impuestos. Y, y los sistemas de impuestos eran aquello que permitía lo que era la redistribución. Esto ha desaparecido. Y toda la economía real está desapareciendo a enorme velocidad, pero a tal velocidad que no es posible la reconversión. Por lo tanto, estamos en un sistema que efectivamente beneficia cada vez a menos gente. Y esto acaba en una contestación. Es lógico que acabe en una contestación. ¿Cómo no podría ser de otra manera? Claro que tiene que acabar en una contestación. Y lo que tenemos que ser capaces es de, de, de alguna manera, evitar los agravios de este tipo de población. Tenemos que empezar a pensar que esta gente no son, no son de alguna manera, una especie diferente que nos está invadiendo, que somos nosotros decepcionados. Somos nosotros decepcionados. Todos nosotros podemos acabar siendo populistas, todos y cada uno de nosotros. Claro, esto es un reducto de gente de alguna manera formada, etcétera, etcétera, internacional, es, es, tardará más. Pero todos nosotros podemos llegar a ser populistas. Buena parte de estos populistas no lo eran hace cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez años. Y lo son ahora. Por tanto, ¿qué tenemos que hacer? Tenemos que revertir este tipo de políticas y tenemos que empezar a pensar de esta manera, pero no lo hemos hecho hasta ahora. No lo hemos hecho hasta ahora porque pensábamos que esto era un fenómeno de alguna manera transitorio, menor o de otra categoría. Y tenemos que empezar a pensar, y esto es la gran ventaja del Brexit, que es, o, o de Trump, ahora llegará el, el, el tema de Trump, demonios, que esto tiene un carácter subversivo, un enorme potencial desestabilizador y que el mundo que puede emerger de esto es un mundo... Fijaros que es una situación, a mí, perdóname que os diga, en fin, yo ahora mismo sitúo la situación de, de Brexit y pienso en la Gran Bretaña de 1931, cuando devalúa la libra esterlina, cuando llega a la, la preferencia imperial, cuando Roosevelt devalúa el dólar y cuando todo el sistema internacional que hemos conocido se va al carajo. Pero no quiero hacer paralelismos, pero hay situaciones, la historia nos ayuda de alguna manera a esto. Es decir, hay cambios. Y es un cambio en la actualidad muy similar a aquel que se produce entre 1931 y 1934, del cual aquellos que rompen la globalización entre el 31 y el 34, que son Winston Churchill y Delano Roosevelt, tienen que volver a reconstruir la globalización en 1944. Es decir, aquellos que la rompen entre el 31 y el 34 son los mismos que la tienen que reconstruir a partir de 1944 con el sistema de Bretton Woods. Por lo tanto, poca broma. Sí, no, uh, es, quería decir también algo respecto a esta pregunta sobre el, el, los referéndums y el populismo. Yo creo que lo que he dicho antes respecto a Nigel Farage, 
um, es interesante al respecto, porque es, es cómo conseguir cambiar la agenda política desde fuera. Digamos. El referéndum es el resultado de una demanda que sale desde un, un grupo de Tories, pero que era un grupo que inicialmente era bastante marginal y que ha ido creciendo, y luego Nigel Farage desde fuera haciendo presión sobre David Cameron. Entonces, de algún modo, um, se, crea, se crea la necesidad política de responder a este grupo de presión uh, a, a partir de esta campaña. Es, esta es la dinámica, digamos, que nos lleva al referéndum. Pero hay una lógica de fondo también en respecto a la Unión Europea que es muy clara. Y es que el, la cultura política británica cree en el Parlamento y no cree en el Parlamento Europeo o en las instituciones europeas. Es decir, um, en vez de aceptar de que Europa es una, una serie de acuerdos entre Estados-Nación, se crea la imagen de que hay algo más. Hay un Parlamento, hay un, una Comisión Europea, que sin, embargo, que sin embargo hacen cosas que a nosotros no nos gustan, no entendemos, no nos convienen. O sea, se crea una, una cultura política, yo creo, en el fondo poco honesta, porque es decir, si, si tú votas a un, un gobierno y este gobierno negocia unas cosas, tú has votado indirectamente estas cosas. Como si, 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 si negocias un tratado internacional, tú lo aceptas. ¿no? El, 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 sin embargo, en, yo creo que en el, en el caso británico se ha creado la idea, a lo largo de décadas, dicho que esto es importantísimo, de que lo que sucede en Bruselas es contrario a lo que sucede en Londres en vez de verlo como algo que Londres ha negociado. Y a partir de aquí, pues, se crea, yo creo, la posibilidad de que la voz del pueblo tiene que ser escuchada. Y una vez así escuchado como ahora, Brexit means Brexit. Es decir, todo lo que sea un acuerdo entre las élites de, de Londres y las élites de Bruselas que no respete la idea del Brexit, será visto como una traición a la voz del pueblo. Esta es la gran dificultad de 3 de mayo. ¿Cómo negociar? sin traicionar. Bien, uh, perdón que interrumpa, pero no sé si sería mejor dejar el resto de preguntas para la sesión final, que al final vamos a reunir uh, todas las preguntas y dar paso o hacer una pausa de cinco minutos. ¿Es breve la pregunta? Venga, adelante pues. Vale. Solo... ¿Se oye? Bueno. ¿Está no? Sí, vale, vale. Pues a ver, es, es respecto a una posibilidad que se ha hablado al menos en los medios respecto a la política interna dentro de la, de la Gran Bretaña. ¿Existe realmente la posibilidad de que vía la acción parlamentaria una votación en contra de unas nuevas elecciones se revierta de alguna manera el Brexit, el, el resultado del referendo, o es una construcción de los medios? La, la, en mi punto de vista es que el gran debate um, en, en el Reino Unido es qué significa el Brexit. Es decir, nadie niega que hubo una mayoría, pero no hubo un plan concreto de Brexit que se votase. No hay un 52% a favor de un hard Brexit o un soft Brexit. Por lo tanto, no sabemos lo que votó la gente, excepto que no quieren lo que tienen ahora y quieren salir. A partir de aquí hay un enorme margen de negociación. Lo que tenemos ahora es un debate es sobre si esta negociación es una prerrogativa del gobierno, es decir, que Theresa May puede hacer lo que le dé la gana al negociar, o tiene que obtener un permiso y unos acuerdos en el Parlamento como mínimo. Y luego, posiblemente, esta es la segunda fase de la discusión, someter el resultado a votación otra vez. Porque nos podemos encontrar perfectamente, y me parece un un argumento muy legítimo, que lo que se ha acordado nos gusta menos que lo que teníamos. Entonces, es, esta, digamos, es, el, es el, el campo de juego que existe. Y, y claro, aquí ganar tiempo es ganar posibilidades para un soft Brexit. Porque, claro, el impacto inicial es que los que han tomado control del proceso negociador son la gente que estaba marginada en el partido Tory, gente como David Davis que no pintaba nada, era un caso único a lo han puesto al centro de las negociaciones uh, a Boris Johnson lo, lo, han, lo han puesto para hacer el payaso y se lo van a echar cuando ha hecho más, más, más payasadas y, y, y Liam Fox es un, es un personaje que tiene muy poco respeto dentro de los círculos intelectuales y académicos y, y, y gente que entiende, o sea, yo que realmente creo que aquí um, a, es cuestión de ganar tiempo. 
No, de, de aquí hay una estrategia eh, y, eh, extraordinaria de Teresa May. Es decir, Teresa May lo que hace con todos estos nombramientos, de todos estos impresentables, lo que hace es que desactiva el UKIP. El UKIP lo desactiva, el UKIP desaparece y está desapareciendo. Y eso es lo que Teresa May necesita para que aquello que acuerde no pueda ser desestabilizado a través del exterior, a través del UKIP. Buena, buena parte de su lenguaje, buena parte de su lenguaje, del hard, Brexit means hard, uh, hard Brexit, todo esto y este tipo de nombramientos, lo que tiene es un objetivo prioritario, que es desactivar aquellos que han sido la oposición más activa. Una vez que desactive esto, la negociación no la hace Boris Johnson, y, y, sino que la van a hacer los funcionarios británicos que están perfectamente cualificados para hacerlo. Y lo que van a hacer básicamente es negociar las condiciones mínimas para cumplir un Brexit, lo mínimo posible. Mismo no pinta nada porque cometieron harakiri el día siguiente, pero eso es otro tema para luego. Luego podemos seguir uh, hablando, por supuesto, perdón por, por cortar. ¿Les parece que hagamos tres minutos de pausa para que hagamos el cambio de Trump? Vamos al baño y volvemos. ¿Sí? Gracias. Hola. Bueno, comencemos a la segunda sesión de esta jornada sobre populismos um, con una fotografía que creo que amb una imatge, eh, ja ho tenim tot dit, eh, estudiem l'elecció la, a la presidència dels Estats Units de Donald Trump. Um, si, jo, eh, si cinc anys enrere m'haguessin dit que el tema de la meva tesi, és a dir, l'estudi d'en Huey Long, eh, ara estaria tan de moda, no m'ho hagués cregut, perquè realment dona que pensar a uh, la lección de este personaje. Bé, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, switch this, uh, the language because I'm assuming we're going to do this uh, in English. So, hi, welcome um, for the new people that have come uh, right now. We have here uh, Linda Jones, Enrico Zelay and uh, Steven Jacobson. Uh, Linda is uh, investigadora Ramón y Cajal here at Pupel Fabra and she uh, specializes on the history of uh, ethnic uh, and religious minorities. Enrico Zelay Dacal is uh, professor uh, emerito, uh, catedratic emerit, emeritus professor here at Pumbao Fabra too. And uh, uh, he is a specialist on Catalanism and nationalism and, uh, and of course, uh, history in the United States. And finally, we have uh, uh, Stephen Jacobson, who is a professor here at Pumbao Fabra and um, head of the department of the Institute of uh, History Institute, the uh, Universidad uh, uh, Jaume Vicens Vives, uh, here at Bumba Fabra as well. And uh, he is a specialist on Catalanism and nationalism and imperialism. But they're all, they were all born in the United States, so their insights and their comments will be, uh, I'm sure, very interesting and very, uh, very suggestive. So thank you very much uh, to the three of you for, uh, for being here today. We will start with Linda, and then Professor Jacobson, and then Enrico Zelay. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. There you go. So thank you very much for inviting me here. I, I have to admit that when I was first invited to speak, I, I actually didn't want to because I, it's still very difficult to sort of process all of this. But um, anyway, so here we go. Um, look, I'm going to focus my comments on three points. Uh, in the first place, I just want to uh, point out briefly um, some, um, well, brief commentaries on why he won, right, on why Trump won. Uh, the second um, set of comments has to do with the impact of the campaign, of Donald Trump's campaign uh, on uh, religious and ethnic minorities and what his uh, presidency might mean for, for these collectives. And in my final comments, I will address some precedents, uh, you know, of, uh, of fascism uh, in U.S. history as sort of predecessors of the Donald Trump phenomenon. So very briefly, uh, as 
regards the comments, the commentaries on why he won, well, I started to look around and read various uh, newspaper articles and um, things on the web, and I've been able to sort of isolate uh, maybe six uh, reasons, and maybe some of the other people on the panel will uh, comment, but uh, obviously there are multiple factors. Uh, first of all, one I think which is very important is uh, that he was, as a Republican and as a populist um, politician, he was able to galvanize the vote of a large segment, sector of the American population, especially of the, in the Midwest and the so-called uh, Rust Belt states of the Upper Great Lakes, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, etc. Um, a lot of these people whose uh, profile are white working class people from the old industrial base, uh, you know, part of the so-called losers, you know, out of globalization, etc. Well, uh, those are people who several decades ago uh, used to vote Democrat and over the last few decades um, have, have gradually gone over to voting uh, Republican. And um, this mainly has to do uh, with some changes that have been made in the Democratic uh, Party with their own strategies of wanting to reach out more in order to capture the votes of, you know, big business, Wall Street, the large pharmaceutical com uh, companies and big oil companies, etc. And there's increasing feeling that, that they've sort of left behind um, or abandoned the working class uh, men and women. And this was a group of people that... Um, uh, Trump in his campaign was able to um, was able to attract. So we have that. And then uh, the second one is uh, what some people have called the backlash of the angry white man. And this is more of a racial argument. Uh, so the argument goes that uh, infuriated by having had to withstand eight years of a presidency of an African American man, the uh, who was president and commander-in-chief, the thought of having to stomach four years, at least, of a woman, on top of that was just too much. Uh, so uh, that shows then um, uh, that those who thought that Obama's election confirmed that Americans were now living in a post-racial society, uh, well, that argument has shown to be sadly, uh, sadly mistaken. Um, then, and I'll just uh, go on in order not to take up too much time, uh, a third reason, uh, and this has to do more, partly more with Her Hillary Clinton herself, uh, a number of people have pointed out a number of character flaws and I think also what could be included, uh, considered um, strategy uh, flaws. So the character flaws are supposedly that um, too many people were convinced by the media and by her Democratic and her Republican opponents that Hillary was dishonest and that she was untrustworthy. So saying one thing, giving one message to general audiences and another message to um, private audiences of, bis of biggest, uh, big business uh, types. And then there are a number of uh, strategies, strategic errors, you know, in her campaign. So I remember being in the United States uh, this last year during the period of, of the campaign. I was there twice over a three-week period on different times. And I remember thinking, where is she? You know, she's just sort of disappeared from the media for a couple of weeks on end, whereas every day Donald Trump was in the news, there was a new item with him showing him in a different city giving a speech or a presentation or doing something very active every day and she was not appearing and ex the only thing that was appearing were these um, ads you know these these advertisement these advertisements that she had um, uh, paid for but it's not the same as you know being out there and being seen uh, you know, talking to people, etc. Um, also, another error that I think came back to haunt her was um, an insult that she made to his voters by calling them a bunch of deplorables. So the media uh, 
really um, latched on to that and talked about that for a very long time. And it was just an off-the-cuff comment that probably shouldn't have made such a big deal, but it uh, really uh, it made a lot of damage to uh, her. Um, also, the novelty, I think the novelty of having the first woman president was undermined by this perception that she just represented too much of the status quo. Mm -hmm. You know, had she's been around in politics for a very long time, she had been first lady, she'd been a senator, uh, secretary of state, etc., at a time when people were wanting something new and there was a perception that she just wasn't novel enough in that sense. Then, I think another argument is misogyny. So a lot of commentators, including in right-wing uh, or to-the-right conservative newspapers such as the Huffington Post, have noted that there was quite a lot of misogyny uh, in the campaign, especially in the debates, in the way that she was handled as a candidate in comparison with the way her male opponents, whether they were the Democrats in the early period or when she was going head to head with Donald Trump. So uh, one um, commentator from the Huffington Post uh, quoted, uh, said that he, he believed that the elections revealed a staggering gender biases, mostly in the constant and baseless scrutiny of Clinton's character. So the idea that she was being subjected to more scrutiny than her male ca counterparts. And, you know, obviously we can talk about stereotypes about how women that are seeking power are seen to be vilified as being pushy or aggressive or corrupt, etc., when the same thing doesn't happen to men necessarily uh, who are running for office. Um, let's see, let me skip. Then, well, I have more to say about that, but I'll, I'll, just, continue, I'll just go on. Then... Another uh, factor was what are called the depressed Saunders voters. So those voters, those people who uh, enthusiastically supported Saunders and were disappointed when Hillary won the uh, candidacy. You know? um, now, it's true that in the end, there, there, there was a move on his part to rally those people and get them to go and vote for Hillary. And yet, people who follow voting patterns and say that, you know, what, one of the things that really helps is the capacity to not only decide your vote, but to bring along, you know, three or four or five other of your peers to vote with you. And, you know, and that the people who uh, were former Saunders um, uh, voters, supporters, who begrudgingly voted for her, weren't able to attract those other people. So there's, there's that too. And then there's another factor that I, for lack of a better word, I would call chuleria. So there's this attitude among the Americans, and this is something that Michael Moore um, pointed out when he predicted that uh, Trump would win. This attitude that Americans will vote for him just because everybody is saying that they should not. So it doesn't matter whether he's the right candidate or not, it's just the idea that, well, no one's going to tell us what to do. We're just going to vote for him. So it's chuleria, no? Or a sort of what I would call rebeldia sin causa, no? Mm. A re a, you know, a rebellion without a cause type of uh, mentality. Then, of course, and this is the final one, uh, the media coverage, biased media coverage and especially disturbing increase in the publication of fake news in this so-called uh, post-truth era, which I find uh, really, really alarming. So one could talk about lots of instances in which the media coverage, one of the things that I found, for example, and this was just a perception, was that the media coverage uh, was imbalanced in the sense that there were much more stories about Hillary tied to the scandals, the emails or things like this, and not enough about what her political policies were, would be. And this, this was not the case with Donald Trump, right? Um, so anyway, so those, those, um, 
that, that is what I want to have to say about that. So moving quickly on to uh, focusing on what the Trump campaign and the presidency meant for ethnic and religious minorities, well, it's just basically to say that a number of, of observers uh, noticed, uh, have noted over the past year, serious concerns about the racist, uh, xenophobic, as well as sexist discourse that has characterized Donald Trump's uh, campaign. I quote one person, uh, Lauren Kas uh, Karasik, the director of International Human Rights Clinic at the Western New England University Law School, who predicts that, the pre that his presidency will be, quote, a catastrophe for human rights and the rule of law, uh, unquote. And he directly blames him and his bellicose language um, uh, for increased attacks against uh, different minority groups, uh, Muslims, African Americans, etc. And uh, the disturbing trend of turning this into, you know, language into action. Uh, so contributing to, quote, a climate of increased bullying in schools and populations uh, that he targeted, and in a surge of ha hate campaigns against Muslims uh, and others. Um, so it suffices to remind, to remind ourselves of the vicious racist comments that he made about Mexicans and other Latinos, the campaign to promise to build a wall along the border to stop uh, immigration, uh, the infamous threats to prohibit the entry of Muslims into the United States or to obligate Muslim residents and citizens to sign a registry on a daily base in order to manage them, uh, et cetera. Uh, so um, the... The last thing I'll say about that is that, you know, these are not just perceptions. This is based, for example, on reports from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI, which has cataloged a total of 5,818 hate crimes since uh, 2015 until, until today, uh, a rise of nearly 340 over the year before, including assaults, bombings, threats, and property destruction against minorities, gays, and uh, others, right? So what I have here, and I don't know if you can see the first one, this is, these are just a few examples that I'm going to show now. Uh, here we have something that happened, or uh, a series of letters that were sent out to different mosques in the United States beginning in mid to late November. So mosques and cultural centers across the United States received letters uh, referring to Muslims as children of Satan, calling Trump the new sheriff in town who will cleanse America and make it shine again by eradicating the country's Muslim population. And here there's even a reference uh, to, uh, yes, uh, a threat to doing to the Muslims what Hitler did to the Jews, right? So that's uh, one example. Then we have another example of an attack, uh, which was meant to be an attack on a Muslim, but in fact it was not a Muslim, that also happened in the days after the election. So this is a woman who lives in North California. She suffers from lupus, and I guess she's lost her hair, and so she always wears this headscarf when she goes out. So one day she came back and she found that her car was vandalized, and a note was stuck on it that said, hijab-bearing bitch, this is our nation, now get out. And this is an American woman who is not a Muslim, but this is the kind of thing that people, you know, including the observers and including the FBI, have noted uh, uh, an, an increase. Uh, we also have um, increased attacks against African-American populations. We have one example here of a racist arson attack on a 111-year-old African-American church in uh, Greenville, Mississippi. And I, unfortunately, the, the, the resolution isn't so good, but it was burned on, the nev on November the 2nd. And the arsonist wrote the words, and you can barely make it out here, but what it says here is vote Trump, right? So there's no doubt that the attack was directly related uh, to, the, um, to the elections, right? And then we have another case of a murder in this uh, case of, uh, of an Afri African American who was killed, um, shot, beaten, and left for dead 
by three men, uh, three white men in California, um, and it turns out he was a well-known singer. So uh, that's another uh, example of the um, violence in the aftermath. Uh, so um, let me just move quickly to my third point and just mention briefly some precedents. So people are rather alarmed about, um, about Trump's victory, but um, uh, you know, he represents something that uh, unfortunately we've seen in, in different uh, periods of American history. And a number of observers have concluded that his populist campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, uh, really means uh, or could be interpreted to mean and was understood to mean uh, make America white again. And we, of course, see precedents in the discourse and programs of white nationalist supremacist groups, uh, particularly the Ku Klux Klan, uh, as well as other uh, groups um, in American history. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm making a reference, for example, to one, one observer, a writer named Kelly J. Baker, who, uh, who published a book recently on the Ku Klux Klan, and she noted that uh, many of the goals of William J. Simmons, who was a man who sort of revamped the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, uh, trying to strip it of its vig uh, vigilantism and identify it more with uh, Christian virtues and patriotic pride, um, he promoted, you know, ideals such as, you know, make America 100%, uh, promoting 100% Americanism, um, uh, stating that the nation was in peril uh, because of uh, the influx of the Catholic immigrants and the uh, enfranchisement of African American, uh, the inward migration from the South to other parts of the uh, of the country, and um, that reemergence in the 1920s was a response to these shifting uh, demographics, right, by uh, the um, immigration of uh, people from uh, Catholics from Germany, Ireland, Italy, Poland, etc. A number of Jews also came, around 10% of immigrants, of the 16 million immigrants who came in this period were uh, Jewish, and um, the Klan obviously saw this as a menace. So we can maybe find uh, some similarities uh, with that, uh, those trends and what's going on with the social changes and demographic changes uh, nowadays with having had an African-American president with more uh, rights being given to le lesbians, gays, bisexuals, etc with the enormous uh, influence uh, of the Hispanic community, uh, et cetera, the, which have unleashed fears that America will become a, a majority minority country. So part of it can be seen as, a, as, a, as fears of that. And finally, and I'll just mention very briefly what um, uh, Mariona was mentioning um, before, about these precedents and the figures of people such as uh, Huey Long or um, uh, a Canadian-American priest, Father Coughlin, uh, who also campaigned on similar patterns, you know, and used um, populist rhetoric in their uh, uh, attempts to attract uh, an audience. Oh, what I have here is, uh, on the left, is... Um, is the poster of a play based on a famous novel by Sinclair Lewis called It Can't Happen Here, which uh, was meant to be a sort of a satirical, um, a, sat a political satire uh, loosely based on the figure of Huey Long and uh, obviously set against the backdrop of the rise of, you know, uh, you know figures such as, uh, you know, <laughs> And then on the right, we have a poster from the Ku Klux Klan. And we have here some of their slogans, you know, their, or the things that they stand for, their militant Protestantism. Uh, okay. You turn around. Oh, yeah. Freedom, That's right. free it. politics, better right. schools, better school. free politics, Fix. freedom from... Uh, 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 yeah, greater allegiance to the flag. Yeah. That's yeah. something that's sort of 
echoed in, uh, um, in uh, Trump's uh, campaign. So, you know, many observers have seen sort of parallels there. And my last photo is just, and this I'll end, I'm, I'm finished now, thank you, is uh, just the two uh, photos. On the left we have, Huey P., we have Huey Long, and on the right we have this, um, this Catholic priest, uh, or former Catholic priest, um, no, 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 or Catholic, he was Catholic Catholic right through until his death. Until his death. Yeah. Ah, right, right okay. Ah, oh, right then. 70s. Right. So, you know, the types of people who, uh, you know, obviously used the same kinds of uh, populist um, uh, rhetoric to try to reach out to, you know, working class uh, people on the one hand. This would be especially the case with, um, with Huey Long and uh, Father Coughlin, you know, um, uh, being an, uh, an example of a demagogue, uh, blaming all of America's ills on others, right, on, no, on uh, non-Christian others. Uh, so those are the comments, basically, that I have. I don't think I have anything. Oh, yeah, I'll just simply end, uh, right, by drawing attention to the concerns raised by many observers that uh, Trump might actually attempt to implement the type of authoritarian, authoritarian measures that the character in uh, this play, the protagonist, that can't happen here, uh, yeah, that he introduced, such as outlawing any form of dissent uh, or identifying people and rounding them up and putting them into some sort of you know, concentration camps or other uh, policies aimed at destroying the civil rights of anyone who, who has opposed him. And uh, unfortunately, many of those that he has uh, pledged to appoint uh, make me fear that some of those things might actually happen. So that's how I see it. Thank you very, thank you very much, Linda, for this very interesting historical analysis on Trump. I completely agree with uh, mostly everything you said. So I'm just going to uh, let uh, Jake Jacobson uh, start his presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me, uh, just a peek uh, for organizing this wonderful session. Uh, for Mariona for um, for being such a uh, wonderful chair and for the uh, my the previous speakers who brought up a lot of points some of which I'll, I'll repeat and so I'll try to to go through relatively quickly um, I found the previous section on Brexit uh, by Fernando and John Powell fascinating and 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 Linda's perspective um, quite interesting uh, when I was first asked to do this I was a little bit hesitant because um, I'm not an expert on on uh, United States electoral politics, nor am I a political scientist. Uh, but I thought that the focus on populism uh, was quite interesting. In fact, as a historian and my uh, dissertation advisor, Jose Alvaro Junco, was actually as an expert on pop populism. I've read quite a bit about it and thought perhaps I could offer some things looking at the perspective of populism. I've also relied on some friends uh, in political science to, to try to give me some, some help with trying to make sense of this electoral map. I'll also, in my talk, um, uh, uh, concentrate on the election itself and the subject of populism. I, I, I don't think I can go into, you know, what lies in the future to the extent uh, um, that uh, the speakers on the Brexit, particularly Fernando, spoke uh, about earlier. Obviously, what lies in the future, uh, the future is up for grabs in many respects in the United States. Paul Ryan, who's a Speaker of the House, uh, who was initially ambivalent to Obama, is looking to forge an alliance and and perhaps go after Medicare and Medicaid, which is about the only thing that is, is worthy in the United States of, of, of the welfare state and is, are actually fantastic programs for, for the retired um, uh, uh, in the in interests of oil and gas, um, the future of Obamacare. In fact, the, the, the whole future is a bit up for grabs and going into these very specific things on Medicare, Medicaid and Obamacare. Obviously, I'm, I'm not very qualified to talk about them, and perhaps in the audience today, um, isn't, are, are not, uh, many of you are not familiar with them. But again, the future 
um, uh, I won't talk about. So what I'll try to look at is the election itself and its relationship to populism. And what I've done is uh, looked at this uh, website called Politico, which many people use, which break down the electoral results. And what's very good about this website, if you do take a look at it, is it not only looks at the electoral results of uh, this past election, but it also, um, if you click on the right, um, on the right links, you can get the results of the previous election uh, in 2012 uh, of Obama, and then compare the results uh, with the previous results to see the changing map of electoral politics, in particular where Trump was able to garner votes, not only on a state-by-state -state basis, but on a county-by-county -county basis. And so I'll take a look, little bit of a look, a look at that. Um, so again, with risk of repeating a little bit of what Linda said in her very quick eight points, if you look at the breakdown of these elections on a, on a racial scale, and, on, and not all these statistics are perfect, but basically, as we know, Hillary Clinton's largest support came from African-American populations, around 80%, 88% voted for her, which was less than Obama, but still a very strong um, percentage voting for her. And Hispanic voters, 66% voted for Hillary Clinton, which was uh, a little bit less than Obama, as many have, have commented on in 2012, but very similar to the, the amount of people who voted for Obama in 2008. Um, so again, um, in terms of percentages, not looking at turnout, which the, the statistics aren't in uh, yet, her support chiefly came from African-American and Hispanic voters were the largest groups that came out in support of her. Well, Donald Trump's largest supporter came from white voters, 58% of all white uh, people voted for him, in particular white men, white men without a university degree, 70% voted. So more white men without a university degree voted for Trump than Hispanic voters voted for Clinton, not more, a higher percentage. And, in, and white women without a university degree, a little bit less, of around 60%. And um, because of low voter turnout in the United States, uh, you have, we have to temper these percentages with information on turnout, and this is a bit difficult to do since the information isn't, isn't out yet um, on, on turnout, but we have some ideas in, in terms of total turnout. We know the total turnout was 59%, which was a bit higher than 2012, which was 58%, but significantly less than 2008, 62%, and, in, and less than 2004, which was 60%. So in many respects, Americans thought that there was less at stake in this election than, say, the 2004 election following the War of Iraq or the 2008 election following the financial crisis. So uh, there's, uh, there, there, this still has to be analyzed a bit. And, um, but also, in the U.S. elections, voter turnout isn't really that important because what's very key is the voter turnout in the battleground states, so to speak, the, the states that are up for grabs because if you're living in Massachusetts or California, New, New York or Texas or, or Georgia, your vote really doesn't count. And so in the battleground states, 70% uh, voted in Wisconsin, 62% uh, in Pennsylvania, 64% Ohio, 66% in Michigan, 66% in Florida. And so it was these states really with pretty high voter turnout in which the, the election depended. Um, it seems, uh, though specific figures I know, that, that African-American black turnout was, was down and Hispanic turnout may have been down, we're not sure yet. But what's very clear is for demographic reasons, more Hispanic voters voted forever before. So again, the high Hispanic voter turnout in terms of uh, for Clinton um, means that she probably had a stronger support among Hispanics than, than, than Obama did. And so, um, he, so if you look at this, basically putting all the, 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 the statistics together and then taking a look at the key sort of populist messages of Trump's campaign. And if, if I could take three slogans that he used the most, the first was, as mentioned by Linda, make American great again. But the second two are quite important. The, the other two was drain the swamp at his election rallies. You could hear this saying, drain the swamp, drain the swamp over and over again, which was uh, code for expelling the uh, lobbyists from Washington. Um, uh, in particular, uh, although we know he's not going to expel oil and gas or the National Rochville Association from, from um, Washington, but the leftist lobbies. And then the second um, was build the wall, meaning expel illegal Hispanic immigrants. So these two messages drain the swamp against the political class um, and the lobbyists build the wall against Hispanic minorities, which can be seen as a, as a, as a, as a general message for, for immigrants uh, refugees and minorities in, in general, and you can see that this populist message basically seemed to work as a racial response. The defeat of the victory of, of Trump can be Trump can be attributed to this pop popular racial response against immigrants, uh, minorities, uh, and uh, the political class. And the defeat of Hillary Clinton can turn be explained by 
her inability to stimul stimulate voter turnout, perhaps as Obama had done among minorities, her lack of a populist message, this, as, as Linda pointed out with her ads and, and her incapacity to, to deliver a populist message, even though she was much closer to the people in many respects than Trump was. Trump was very aloof, but he could give a very strong populist message. Um, and the fact that she also became embodied again is this, 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 this embodiment of the political class. So this is a bit the, the, the traditional interpretation that's been given so far. And, and what I'll do for the rest of my time is offer a little bit of a, a different view. But going along with the traditional view, I guess the place where this works best is Florida. So if you look, for example, at the electoral map of Florida, which when I was uh, awake at 3 o'clock or 3.30 in the morning and the electoral counts came in in Florida, uh, uh, I knew that, he, that she had lost when she had lost Florida. And here you can see the electoral map of Florida by county. Um, in, um, uh, in, in Florida, with the blue obviously representing the Democrats and the red representing the Republicans. But what's amazing about the Florida electoral map, and again, I, I owe this analysis a little bit to my colleagues in political science, is that in these three key counties, uh, Dade, um, Broward, and Palm Beach County, in which the majority of, uh, well, I don't know, majority of the large percentage of Floridians live, um, she did better, Hillary Clinton, than Obama did in 2012. In fact, um, she, she, for example, won 64 percent in Miami-Dade County, while Obama in 2012 won 62 uh, percent. And so, in fact, when some political scientists saw these results came, came in, and they came in earlier than the rest of the states during the evening, people thought that because she had polled so highly in Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach that the Democrats were going to win Florida, and in fact, then they would win the election. Obviously, this turned um, this turned pear-shaped very quickly. Um, Orlando, uh, in some places, were around big cities such as Orlando or Tampa or Tallahassee or Gainesville, Florida, here in the middle where the university is. Um, she, she did win, but she was absolutely killed along the Gulf Coast in the north, um, presumably due to her inability to bring out the African-American vote and her poor popularity among poor whites convinced by Donald Trump's message. So if you look at, again, the map of Florida, you see this very clear racial division and this very, um, uh, uh, this idea uh, uh, of an America divided on racial lines and a, a populist message among uneducated whites being key to the victory of, victory of Trump, who literally wanted to drain the swamp. In fact, if you look at the swamp countries in here, they voted overwhelmingly for Trump. So I don't know if that had anything to do that the metaphor was, was particularly, or particularly convincing in the glades. Um, however, uh, what I'd like to do with the rest of my time is say, is talk about why I think that the, this populist message in the United States was fundamentally different than the Brexit vote. Uh, if you look at it here, what I've analyzed so far, it corresponds a little bit to what John Powell was talking about with the Brexit, Brexit vote. But first of all, and I think this is very important, the latest statistics uh, published a few days ago by the Cook Report last week uh, reveals, and this is important, that Hillary Clinton did win the elections, right? I mean, she won. 65,527,625 people voted for her, and 62,851,000 people voted for Trump. In fact, she won the, the elections by full two percentage points, 61 to 59 percent. Um, and indeed, since the election of Bill Clinton in 1992, the Republicans have only won the popular vote once, that was in 2004 uh, by George Bush, and in fact he won by 51 to 48, very similar to what Clinton, Hillary Clinton lost, um, and it was the lowest margin for an incumbent victory. So um, again, the, 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 I, especially I was very angered the other night when I was looking at the Austrian elections and the analysts were saying, well, why did the Austrians vote one way and the Americans vote the other way? It's not exactly true. If, they had, if there had been a Brexit vote in the United States or had been a vote with the similar electoral rules for electing the Austrian president, Hillary Clinton would be president today, not Donald Trump. So there, the, 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 uh, some of this has to be tempered. Um, uh, secondly, uh, and this Linda mentioned, I'll mention again, um, I think it's very important, and this, di this distinguishes obviously the U.S. vote from Brexit, is that the third, the first two discursive arms in the populist message, drain the swamp and, um, and, uh, I, and, uh, uh, and uh, build the wall, um, were obviously against the political class and minorities, but the one message that was repeated over and over during his campaign were these misogynist messages because Hillary Clinton was, 
was a woman. I'll mention them in a second, but at least for me, and here I'm not, I'm really on, 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 not on the best ground, and perhaps Fernando can help me out later, but I think it still remains to be seen in Europe and the United States whether a woman can win on the political center and left. I mean, Célégion Royale in France lost, France lost in 2007, and Hillary Clinton lost in the United States in 2016. In other words, women who are supported by feminists rather than Christian Democrats um, can, can win elections in major uh, European and United States countries. It's still, to me, not clear, and perhaps somebody can, 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 can bring up some, um, I mean, in, in Scandinavia, but Scandinavia is Scandinavia, I mean, in, in, in other countries uh, where this occurred. But I'm still not convinced that women can, can, can win elections coming from the left, perhaps coming from the right, like Angela Merkel or center-right or Margaret Thatcher, in which they're, they, where, where, where traditional Christian and maternal values are somehow incorporated within the, the, the figure of the, the, the women candidate, but not when the women candidate is associated with feminist politics in particular. And obviously, the ability of Trump to associate with her with feminists was, uh, was very successful. But not only that, the rallying cries of the Trump rallies, things that he couldn't enter, were, were really amazing. Um, so, uh, for example, a Trump rallies consistently ended with rallying cries such as lock her up. They would repeat lock her up, lock her up, hang that bitch, hang that bitch, hang that bitch. Some of the misogynist gear that was sold around the election not only included t-shirts, it included t-shirts that read that Trump that bitch, Hillary sucks but not like Monica, or I wish Hillary had married OJ, stuff like that. A million other slogans, mostly equate, equating Hillary to a lesbian, uh, a ball breaker, or, or a slut, or somebody who facilitated her, her husband's extramarital affairs, or in fact had her own against the, what was that guy's name, Vincent Foster, who, was a, who, who committed suicide in the early, early, uh, early part of the Clinton administration, who was supposedly one of her, uh, her lovers. Uh, obviously, uh, Hillary, uh, Trump herself, uh, Trump himself promoted her, her as crooked Hillary. Um, and all of this, as Linda mentioned, had, was quite amazing because if you look at, 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 at her, this populist rhetoric that, that compared her with corruption, it, you know, the, the corruption, none of the corruption ever stuck to Hillary Clinton. I mean, there's, there's really no evidence of political corruption uh, anywhere. And, and the, the, the FBI investigation into the emails obviously came up clean. And in fact, if you look at Trump, he's associated with a fraudulent university, Trump University, a fraudulent unregistered charity, Trump Charity, but somehow the Clinton Foundation received more, um, more, more bad press. He'd gone bankrupt six times and served as either a plaintiff or defendant in over 3,000 lawsuits. Uh, indeed, if Republican I think if Republican candidates had been permitted to use race against Obama to the extent that the press or whoever, the United States or the electorate or the, the people uh, allow uh, misogynist rhetoric to use about, uh, against Hillary, then Obama's fate may have been quite different. But obviously, a, a certain racial, you can't, you can't use racial uh, slurs in political slogans to the extent that you can still use misogynist slurs. Um, my third point, and this is where the, the real difference I see with Brexit um, is that, is, is the economic difference, and going back to particularly John Powell, who concentrated mostly on the election. Um, the question still is, um, did people vote for Trump because of this racial nationalism and for economic nationalism? And I made the argument earlier that racial nationalism would have a lot to do with it, especially if you looked at the electoral results of, of Florida. But I'm not completely convinced that this argument works in the so-called Rust Belt, where in fact is where many people have, have, have attributed to it. So if you look, for example, um, let's look at, at Michigan. Oh, I'm in Florida, sorry. Why don't you look at Ohio first? Oh, I'm going to look at Ohio first, I think. There it is. Yeah. So if you look at Ohio, for example, um, before I do this, it's, it's not clear that it's a racial message because in the, if you look at the Rust Belt states, there's so many counties that overwhelmingly voted for Obama in 2012 
and then switched and voted for Trump in 2016. And so in that way, it's very hard to, to attribute their switch and vote to racism if they voted overwhelmingly uh, for a black candidate in 2012. Um, in other words, the message, Make America Great Again, was not only a racial message, as, as Linda messaged, but it was also an economic national, na nationalist message. In other words, to recapture manufacturing jobs lost to globalization, uh, to, to renegotiate the NAFTA Free Trade Treaty, and to uh, cancel the upcoming Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, and here is where I think it's different, because I guess, as John Powell mentioned, I totally agree with him, in Brexit, the argument of the the, 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 those in Brexit who, who favored to stay within the European Union was that there were economic advantages despite the fact that there was a, 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 a secession of democracy or a democratic deficit because of joining Europe. So one of the messages of the Brexit supporters was in fact that even though the economic benefits, uh, or at least in the short term, the economic consequences might be harsh in the long term that Britain would recapture uh, a better quality of democracy was not the case in the United States. The argument in the United States was exactly the opposite, was that the free trade treaties that Obama had entered into and was currently negotiating, or Clinton, Bill Clinton had entered into with the NAFTA and the and Trans-Pacific Partnership that were on the Democrats were somehow economically prejudiced. Um, so if we look by a, on a county by county electoral maps in these key states, for example, and I don't have time to look at both of them, but here if you look, I think that's Trumbull County, uh, which is outside of Cleveland, it voted 60% to 38% in favor of Obama in 2012. So it's very hard to say that the voters of Trumbull Car uh, County are racist because they voted 60 to 38% in favor of Obama, but then voted 51% to 45% in favor of Trump in 2000 in 16, again, that's an 18-point um, shift between the two elections from voting from a, um, uh, a candidate. So in, in that respect, if you look at that, it, you probably, the misogynist rather than the racist argument seems to, to hold more water. Uh, in Michigan, uh, for example, uh, Macomb County, and I don't have time to look at it because they just gave me the, 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 the percentages voted. If you can look at Michigan, you have to hit a back, a back arrow first. Um, Macomb County, which is a white suburb outside Detroit, voted 52% for Obama and 48% for Romney, but in 2016 switched 54% for Trump and 42% uh, in Hillary, a 14-point swing. And this was a county with the third largest population in Michigan, 85% which is white. And again, these swings of 18 and 14 percentage points occur a lot across the West Rest Belt, and it's very difficult to attribute these swings to, to racism because these counties had overwhelmingly voted in favor of a black candidate. And so in that case, um, I guess it, hope, it offers a little hope, um, well, I don't know, that, that perhaps the, the scenarios that Linda was painting at the end might not be come true, but it also uh, offers, I think, a point of, 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 of difference between the U.S. populism, this economic nationalism of the Rust Belt, and the, this democratic nationalism, this higher quality of democracy in Britain argument in favor of the Brexit voters, even though the racial profiles of the voters were the, themselves, the populist messages in the two cases were, were, were quite different. Uh, Quickly, in one of the future holds, not in future of the United States, but I think if you look at the electoral map, um, it seems that these Rust Belt states, if they are voting on economic nationalism, if Trump is unable to reverse the trends of inequality, which Fernando had spoke about, if U.S. growth continues to be strong as it was under, under uh, Obama, but becomes distributed very unequally and, 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 and does not really um, help out these poor white voters in the Rust Belt, it could be that their vote changes back to Democrats. So particularly in states that are highly contested, such as Pennsylvania and Michigan, it's not clear that in the future that they'll always be voted, that this, this, this racial difference will, will, will harden and become part of the Republican elect, electorate. Um, moreover, if you look at the way demographics are moving in Florida, it looks like Florida, as well as perhaps Arizona in the future, will probably move towards a Democratic camp. And so if you look at these, these changes, uh, for example, in the past election, if Florida and Arizona had voted Democrat, um, then Clinton would have won. Maine and New Hampshire voted 
for, for, for Democrat in these last elections, but if Trump wasn't running, probably would have voted Republican. So you can do this, you can do the math in a number of ways, but it comes to be a very close electoral map in the future, and it would be, would be very favorable to the Democrats, in fact, if these Rust Belt voters are voting on economic reasons and become four years disenchanted with Trump for having failed to deliver upon the economic promises that he promised in, in the election. So I'll, I'll leave it at that um, with trying to show some, some similarities and differences with the, with the Brexit vote and in fact perhaps not auguring such a pessimistic scenario as Linda did in the previous uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jacobson. Now, um, and Dick, uh, yep. you have still time. So. Uh, I'm going to cut part of what I was going to do. I wanted to comment on uh, Linda Jones's paper and on uh, Stephen Jacobson's uh, on uh, uh, Linda's and, Steve and Jake's papers uh, or presentations. There's one factor I would add to the elections, which is the role of FBI Director Comey, which was uh, outstandingly scandalous, and which uh, would seem, uh, changing movie scenarios that we are all used to, that uh, uh, there is a CIA-FBI break, but in which the FBI isn't necessarily the, the good guys. Um, to comment also on uh, the for instance, mistaken hate crimes, hate crimes directed against people who have nothing to do with. I seem to remember the first hate crime after 9-11 was the murder of a Sikh. He was wearing a turban, so he had to be a Muslim, right? Um, and uh, on the role of the KKK uh, and on uh, Canadian-born uh, Father Coughlin, um, I discovered, I was reading a book yesterday, uh, that the KKK was extraordinarily strong in the 1920s and through the 1930s in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, 50,000 strong, uh, 50 to 70,000 strong. Uh, and the KKK has a big change, strongly anti-Catholic in the 1920s, and the very presence of Coughlin indicates that there's a shift. And the shift becomes uh, centered on Detroit, what's called the Black Legion, but it's Ku Klux Klan with, with black uh, regalia, and it's a, a basically racist, it's basically anti-black anti immigrants from the South. And the reflection this has on what Jake was, plan, uh, was presenting, which is very high participation, certainly by European standards, we're talking about 70-some uh, percent participation, but Six, Democrats, uh, six Democrat victories of popular vote in the last seven presidential elections. It's very significant in terms of what is the structure of the using uh, the Electoral College in presidential elections. And in the linking up, Linda and Stephen, with the uh, use of very simplistic, very attractive, uh, simple-minded slogans and their power and their power even to generate hate crimes, the most spectacular hate crime in, uh, since the elections uh, was fortunately didn't cause any murders, but was uh, caused by the, by the vehement and venomous fantasies of the son of one of the uh, uh, Trump uh, nominees, uh, Flynn, Flynn Jr., Mad Dog Flynn's dad, Flynn Jr., who invented the whole uh, Pizzagate subject, uh, secret sex crime, uh, abortion in uh, the basement of a pizza. Guy grabs his automatic uh, rifle and decides to do a personal investigation, quote unquote. So he aims it directly at the poor pimply uh, guy at the cash register and says, you know, what's in your basement? And then starts shooting. This was not last Sunday, it was the Sunday before last. Uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm going to go to uh, my, uh, this one, right? And I'm going to, uh, Civil War culture is because I was borrowing uh, something I already had, but I decided it was perversely appropriate. Um, and let's see if I get one of these. First, uh, the capacity of Trump to play with popular culture. Uh, in June, 
this last June, coinciding with the, uh, with the process of Pokemon Go and its takeoff, uh, a new character, a new Pokemon figure, which is Yungus, uh, was immediately identified as a Trump clone uh, and uh, by both partisans and enemies. And, can ind and the fact that this would amuse Trump was indicative of, despite his being extremely thin-skinned, notoriously thin-skinned, of his capacity to tone in on images and use something like this. Uh, in historical terms, I think that Trump uh, reverts back to the two most disastrous presidents in American history by general historiographic consensus, Millard Fillmore after the 1850 California Compromise, uh, who comes into politics through the anti-Masonic Party, then the know-nothings of the American Party, strongly identified with anti-immigration. Really, he's really a much more complex figure than this, but this is the standard image of a moderate pro-slavery unionist who during the Civil War is accused of being a copperhead. Uh, but the image of know-nothings, of anti-immigration, is something that uh, uh, seems to re reappear in a very different United States some 170 years later. And he obviously also makes uh, Warren Harding look good, who is the other disaster uh, in America. As you know, Americans organize history by presidential administrations. It's just that's the only way to understand anything, according to Americans. Uh, that's what makes them an exceptional society. And I used um, uh, a, an example of propaganda of the d Democrats, who were strongly defeated in the 1920 elections, uh, and in the 1924 elections with John Davis, um, when Harding has had the worst scandals since the Grant administration in, uh, after the Civil War. Okay, uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy. He's someone who's proud to act like a thug. He's mean-spirited, personally vengeful, and he's quite willing to go after small people who he feels have offended him and do uh, very, very systematic lawsuits um, this is, uh, Jake was citing some more than 3,000 lawsuits. Some of these are done by him. This is, I have to admit, I, the other PowerPoint I had was even more emotional. I was talking about Linda, uh, with Linda about this. I've decided not to do it. But I'm quite serious about this. I think Trump is a psychopath. This is a, a scale established by uh, a British... Um, a British uh, psychologist, criminal psychologist, forensic psychologist, who established a list of 20 criteria to establish whether someone is or isn't, can be considered a psychopath. Uh, 20 criteria, the list is, one, glibness and superficial charm, two, grandiose sense of self-worth, three, pathological lying, four, cunning manipulative, five, lack of remorse, six, emotional shallowness, seven, Callowness and lack of empathy. Eight, unwillingness to accept responsibility for actions, something that Trump is particularly famous for. Nine, a tendency to boredom. Ten, a parasitic lifestyle. Eleven, a lack of realistic long-term goals. Twelve, impulsivity. Thirteen, irresponsibility. Fourteen, lack of behavioral control. Fifteen, behavioral problems in early life. Sixteen, juvenile delinquency. Forty, Criminal versatility. 18, a history of revocation of conditional release, that is, broken parole. Uh, 19, multiple marriages and promiscuous sexual behavior. I have no doubt that, this is an article from The Telegraph in April 2014, I have no doubt that Trump would gain the score of 40, which would establish a psychopath. I'm not kidding. I'm quite serious. Uh, um, Hare's argument is that psychopaths can live next door to you, you can work with them, you are not aware. They are apparently seemingly normal people. They're much more of a presence than is normally taken for granted. Uh, so, going the wrong way. Uh, uh, so, on a grand scale, psychopathic or even sociopathic, which is a slightly milder term, can be extremely attractive. Um, in real life, this is uh, the unidentified uh, Rumford thug who was beating up people in Rumford outside of uh, London uh, on a 
unannounced basis, meaning just sort of slamming someone uh, because they looked different. Um, one thing is on an individual uh, scale, another thing is on the big screen. Which is the character? Uh, it's outrageous that six-year-olds can't vote, but what does he really want? A bigger piece of the pie. Uh, we have the problem of the professional celebrity in politics. This is a big change since the 1980s. This is a campaign button uh, from these elections. It's got the MAGA, Make America Great, slogan. But uh, uh, Reagan, whatever you may think of him, had considerable professional experience in politics before he was elected president. Uh, Trump has none. This is Linda's main point, and I completely agree. Uh, the center is an attitude of white backlash, sexist, uh, sexist, and uh, homophobe, and racist, where nobody wants to remember, this is the other side of it, the pendulum swing effect. This is after Obama, now comes the reply. And I remember uh, not so far away in the past, white separatist David Duke, who's, say, shall we say, the most sophisticated kind of uh, clux uh, attractant, who offered to be Trump's VP uh, at the beginning of the summer. Trump is sold as a highly successful businessman. This is how he presents himself. Here is uh, Trump University, among other of his uh, glorious uh, achievements. He's just a con man. He is not a businessman. All he knows how to do is set up attractive cons. Cons in which people put in, uh, investors put in from 100,000 up uh, in his deals and then discover that they lose their money and all they have is a hole in the ground. And when they try and sue him, they find that there is very, very small print on page 18 of the contract which says that they were, he had sold his name, and this has nothing to do with him personally, so he can't be sued, and he walks off happily on his way to the bank. Uh, what does this imply? I think that there, is, uh, there are social patterns here that have to do with very major trends that are outside of the political arena, and which have to do with both uh, uh, Europe and the United States. And it have to do with a process of change, first place, a process of change in uh, forms of communication. Press has become parasitic on sensationalism. Be that yellow press or be that, as they say in Spanish, prensa rosa, uh, pink press. Uh, it is all by definition an act. It's all fake. This is how Trump thinks. He says, I can do that because he thinks in terms of reality TV. He's not thinking in terms of politics. The, the I can do that is a quote from Trump. That is, go to a, go to a, he has a lovely New York accent, go to a, go to an international meeting, I can do that. Uh, it's a role, and he cannot understand anything beyond that. The cultural chain, uh, change signifies that TV, also now threatened, has become sensationalist in response to the progressive collapse of paper press, of print press. And so the reality show, which is on live, is a form of survival. So if we had uh, artificial royals in Hollywood stardom, Hollywood royalty, uh, we now have standard issue artificial billionaires in instant TV stardom. We go from uh, Trump's The Apprentice to Jersey Shore, but Trump's The Apprentice from 2004 and Jersey, for, uh, Jersey Shore in 1220 are interactive transatlantically with a dynamic of cultural change in English-speaking areas, which is in turn a parasite of TV sensationalism, which is what I lack, for lack of a better expression, I've chosen to call clonorama. In other words, The P Apprentice is a clone on Trump's program, but Jersey Shore is a clone on Geordie Shore. Uh, so you have dynamics which are using the same tricks. The man who runs the British The Apprentice is a very similar kind of speculative uh, millionaire or billionaire to than 
uh, is Trump. And you have the same kind of instant TV startup. You have, uh, furthermore, a kind of parasitism on a fourth level, which is social media and the dynamics of trending topics, uh, as shown by uh, PD Pi, um, uh, PewDiePie, sorry, uh, and his bro army meaning you have uh, someone who starts in May 2006 with 3,000 followers, has 50 million followers in December 2016, and is actually making a good deal of money off of this, uh, several millions a month in dollars. Uh, whoop, sorry. Uh, argument, different from what uh, Fernando Guirao was saying, I think that this is a major caesura. It represents a caesura that is as significant in style, in appearance of politics, not necessarily in the legal substance of institutions, but yes, in the appearance of politics, uh, as a series of crises that, that change models of discourse. The uh, post-war collapse, Nazism and what it represents as a change, the end of uh, the Axis regimes, the independence of Israel, and the beginning of desegregation in the U.S., the collapse of empires with the Suez Crisis, the fall of the Soviet Empire, the dissolution of the USSR, and the end of communism, even as a discourse, and Brexit, the Columbia plebiscite against um, the, uh, the pacification, and the Trump elections. And I think this has an interaction with long-term economic crises. Here I am situating what I see as opposed to what I'm told. I'm told that the crisis, the so-called Great Recession, is over in 2013. And in terms of macroeconomic statistics, that may well be. It is not so in terms of street-level life. There are, even in Barcelona, indications of a turn-up. But street-level life remains ugly. And I think that that is true on the Rust Belt in the United States. Uh, the long-term effects of the Great Recession hit and have implications, uh, which are, uh, Fernando Guirao was alluding to some of this, uh, which are what I would call the immiseration of the intelligentsia or the intelligentsia in the Atlantic world, uh, the end of spokesmanship and protagonism for the liberal professions. Producers are no longer leaders, but rather the entire capitalist market in the world, in the West, uh, is dominated by financial speculators and financial concerns. He was speaking of the uh, real economy as opposed to the f financial economy. Those are terms that don't completely convince me. I'm not sure that these work either, but I pose, in any case, the, the concept. And I think that uh, the Great Recession is a, has a, a byproduct collateral damage of uh, the PC and its growth, the robotization of administrative tasks, productive activities, and even to some extent of intellectual life. I'm not sure that uh, classes couldn't be given by holograms and won't be given by holograms. Uh, we're using MOOCs now but you could turn a MOOC into a hologram and give a class relatively easy. You could already do it technically now, and you could probably, and you probably will be doing it in uh, 2025 or 2030. Uh, this is a significant change. In other words, the uh, intellectual sectors, the philosophes, are the spokesmen for the bourgeoisie from the French Revolution, or from the American Revolution for that matter, on. Uh, and... Uh, what is taking place now is, I think, I use this uh, very romantic uh, Norwegian realist painter of a spinner, you have a solid artisanal economy that is working for people uh, at the end of the 18th century, and then you introduce the spinning jenny, then you turn it into a mule, and what one person was producing uh, over a period of time and maintaining a domestic economy now becomes, you have 60 um, uh, spools, you have 100 spools, you have 180 spools, you have 250 spools, and one person, perhaps a woman, perhaps a child, can take care of that. And all the other people are, have simply lost their work. 
Uh, I think this is what is happening now, but it's not happening simply to manual productive trades. It's happening to intellectual trades. Otherwise, the younger people here in the audience would be looking forward to some kind of job, which I don't think they are. Uh, so I think that there is a struggle between millions of erased jobs, which are seen as a natural, ergo invisible loss, meaning that uh, uh, computer tech firms, uh, software firms consider uh, that, you know, millions of jobs are lost. Well, that's not our problem. We're bringing about a great new world in which you can have home delivery. And so, uh, and it'll be carbon free because the home delivery person will take a bicycle to bring you whatever is bring, he's bringing you, he, she, it is bringing you. Uh, so I see the, the use of the term Silicon Valley Party is a serious term, meaning I'm not, I have not invented this. I believe it was Newsweek two weeks ago, had a two-page, long two-page article about the need, the response, how to understand the defeat of, uh, of Hillary Clinton in the last elections. The need was to create from California a Silicon Valley party that would represent the interests of the future as opposed to the past. And I think this is rock hard blind. Uh, finally, in the US, and as I say, even in Spain, the Great Recession is officially over. But the US, as of uh, November 30th last, had an unemployment rate of only 4.9. But those jobs are garbage. There's a beautiful essay from about, what, six, seven years ago by Barbara Ehrenreich, nickel and dimed. She goes and works in uh, different kinds of uh, appliance stores and fast food chains and tries to chronicle the life of the people who are working there. And they are literally, as the expression goes, nickeled and dimed to death. There is no way that one can survive on what one earns. Uh, what reactions will there be to this? I think that there will be. I agree with uh, Dylan and uh, Patty, yeah. Smith. Uh, Patty Smith uh, uh, a few days ago at the uh, Nobel Prize uh, meeting. She got very nervous and she missed her, she missed her cues. But uh, there was, um, this is, by the way, uh, a New York, the, the back photograph is uh, one single photograph. It's a New York subway station that has become a reference point last week. These are photographs sent to me by a friend, more correctly, sent by a friend in New York to a friend of mine in Barcelona who passed them to me. Uh, and I love that one that says, just go, which truthfully is how I feel about the whole thing. Uh, I agree that that's not realistic. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I won't argue that point, but it's simply how I feel. Um, I don't know what reactions. We're supposing that there won't be any reaction. Truthfully, the process of establishing the cabinet that Trump has, has selected is picking up a very characteristic kind of anti-elite loser, people who have lost in, Trump, in turf wars in the last years and are really representative of nothing in particular. So I don't know what's going to happen, and I think it's very easy to assume that nothing is going to happen. Uh, I think it's also easy to, too easy to assume that this will go authoritarian. We don't know what will happen with the whole of the Republican Party. We don't know what response will come from the institutions. Certainly the institutions are playing American politics, and that's why I cited Comey in ways, Comey and the FBI, in ways that were absolutely unimaginable in the past. So in ways that we, we could call third world, European, old world, this is a change. So you don't know what can happen because American discussion is always based on what Americans did. Of course, those examples I used from the 19th century uh, at the beginning of my PowerPoint are examples that are discussing a United States which has no physical relation to what the United States is now. Uh, point, Trump only won. No mandate, but he will claim one anyway. And this will have consequences. He's acting like he is in charge, he is in charge, whoop, uh, ignoring Obama's lame duck presidential end. And this, if I looked up lame duck on the line and I found, I don't know, about 30 pages of uh, imagery, and I borrowed these two from Daffy Duck, uh, in which Daffy is offering his crutches to Obama, and in which Elmer Fudd 
representing white America is there with his shotgun ready to blast away. Uh, and then simply summing up, this is a radically new situation. It is extremely unpredictable, more unpredictable, I think, than the European one. I think uh, Fernando Guidao has made uh, in relation to the image of the election, and uh, which was very uh, neatly presented by Juan Paul Rubies, Fernando Guirao was making a cause for rational analysis and rationally analytic actors. I am not at all sure that Trump is a rational actor. And I have tried to state examples of why I think this. And uh, with that, I'm over and out. Thank you so very much to the three uh, panelists, well, the five panelists. Uh, I think we, because I have a lot of questions regards, uh, in regards to Trump, but I think it's better if we try to open it up to the Brexit uh, case. Uh, so for what I've seen, and I'm, I'm sure you all agree with it or, or not, um, the, the voter in favor of Brexit is quite similar, the profile, to the voter of Trump, which means that there are some concerns uh, that are being expressed politically, like both Trump and Brexit represent a sort of an alternative. So maybe we could reflect a little bit about that. And then in both cases, there's also clearly uh, division. Uh, so uh, we have the, um, the cover of the Time magazine, thanks, Enric, here. And uh, we, we can see here Trump portrayed as the president of the divided states of, of the United States, uh, sorry, the uh, president of the divided states of America. And uh, of course, in Great Britain, we also have a society uh, somewhat divided now. So do you think there's going to be a reunion, a process of reunion? How can that be done? Uh, will it be successful? Of course, we don't know. We can only speculate. So maybe we can reflect upon a little bit about these two things. Or you can respond to uh, each other's presentation. I'm going to take the chair for a moment, and I'm going to answer you right away. Say, ask Chris Christie, who was uh, the head of, uh, Ob of, Obama, of uh, Trump's transition, except that uh, he was uh, a personal enemy of Jared Kushner, of uh, Trump's son-in-law, husband of Ivanka, and uh, because he put, as attorney general, as attorney fiscal, uh, district attorney in, in New Jersey, put in jail uh, Kushner's father for corruption. Uh, and Kushner went out of his way to have him dumped. And now, um, who's running it now? Uh, they, they've, they have, they've had to redo everything. They had to go to take all the papers, very Spanish situation, take all the papers to the White House with Chris Christie. He had it all set up. And then five days later, Christie was out and um, somebody else, a, a, a Trump loyalist was in. Uh, head of the, the, the Pence, National Pence, the VP is no, the, the head, head of the Republican National uh, uh, Convention. The, the, the National Committee. Committee, yeah. yeah I can't the get head his... of the RNC, I can't remember. Yeah, uh, pre, first pre Kushner, First no. Kushner was in. First it was Kushner himself, the son yes, of the and, uh, and, and then it was uh, Christie, and then Christie yeah, was, was shivved. Oh, by Priebus, right. Priebus, yeah. Yeah, um, I, would, I would like to, to follow on the last point that you made about the unpredictability of Trump, because that is, I, I think that is exactly the problem. Um, I had a conversation with a colleague from Harvard in Oxford three weeks ago where we commiserated and asked each other the question, what is worse, Brexit or Trump? I'm sure you all have had that conversation with a friend in the last few weeks. And she was, being an American professor, convinced that Trump was worse. Uh, but then she said, but of course, what I can see is that um, at least you can, we can reverse it in a few years' time. We can vote for someone else. It's not going to last as long as, as Brexit. And they said, yes, you are right there. We, you, you can reverse it quicker because it will take a long time for the whole Brexit catastrophe to be unpicked. I mean, the kind of best case scenario is the one that that, that Fernando was describing, that we slow it down, then it becomes a soft Brexit, and then 10 years from now, perhaps you can't rethink yeah, about it. Knows what but, she actually knows what she's but doing. the question is, what, how much damage can Trump do in the next four years in foreign policy in particular? I think he can do other damage to the US, but I think that can be reversed. 
but the damage in foreign policy may not be so easy to reverse. That is my real concern. Well, I don't know. I, I can't predict the future, obviously, but I do think there's a there's. I'm I'm very concerned about um, both the negative repercussions on the international scene and internally, internally because. Um, even though uh, there were so many Republicans that were against Trump and, you know, came out against him, opposed him, et cetera, we still have a situation where the Republicans control, you know, the House and, uh, you know, the, the Senate and the Congress. Um, we have, uh, there's certainly going to be um, uh, positions in the, in the Supreme Court that will have to be filled during the period when uh, Trump is in office because they've uh, categorically refused to uh, to cons even consider any of the the people that um, Obama had um, proposed earlier. So there's a lot of potential. Uh, you know, it, it remains to be seen what the Republicans will actually do when they have this other vote that's coming up, that, you know, and um, whether they will actually all, you know, vote and ratify all of the, the appointees that, um, that Trump has, has, uh, has named, you know, that, that has to go through a process. But I, I, I don't know how inclined I am to, to think that they might, you know, when push comes to shove, I'm really not sure how much resistance uh, there will be. That's the thing that concerns me. And then on the international scene, I think what really is very um, worrying is, um, uh, well, it goes back to what you were saying about him being more or less a psychopath. I couldn't help but remember uh, interviews that came out. Uh, there was a, I don't remember his name, but um, uh, one of the things that put Trump it made Trump famous several decades ago was this book, this sort of supposed autobiography, The Art of the Deal. Uh, and Har Harvey Schwartz, I think, Harry Schwartz. Is that it? Okay, so he came out, the, the ghost writer, yeah. the person who really wrote the book, came out and said, well, he just couldn't stand it anymore. He had to come clean and speak about what Trump really was like. And he basically, you know, a lot of the things that were in the list of what constitutes a psychopath were on his list, except for where it said, I don't know, it said one other thing, and he used uh, ADD, somebody who has attention deficit syndrome, who's just always on to the next yep. thing, has, you know. So somebody like that, um, I don't know. I mean, even though it's true, he, he, he's not an island, and he can't, make up foreign policy on his own, et cetera. But I, 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 I think I'm still inclined to think that he's in, a, he's in a position where he's able to do a lot more harm than good. And I'm not really sure the extent to which somebody like himself can actually be tamed, you know, mm -hmm. by the institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, he's somebody who's so uh, apt to sort of just go beyond, you know, the rules don't apply to me. Uh, Etc. So, you know, we'll, I think he's, he's going to put the um, United States institutions and all the checks and balances and all of that to, to the limits. So we'll, we'll just have to see. Yeah, I'd like to answer that question. Um, I guess I, I don't think Trump's really a psychopath, and, and, and I do think probably it will be undone in four years. Um, because I just, as I said earlier, I just don't think that the economic promises he made to these key states will prove true. I think inequality will continue to, 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 to increase despite, despite economic growth and that um, these very key states, particularly Pennsylvania and, and um, uh, uh, Michigan, will, will, will switch back and Florida and Arizona may come along as well. Um, but in any case, uh, so I don't think, uh, I, I, I think it can be undone. <laughs> Having said that, I'm also fearful of what can happen in four, four years. Uh, uh, I think that what can happen in four years, Trump can immediately forge an agreement with the House Majority Leader Paul Ryan to redo Medicare and Medicaid and, and deny health care to most of the elderly in the United States or to roll back health care elderly in the United States. Uh, right before... Uh, um, during the Obama administration, the state police were being used in many southern states to um, 
to implement federal law by deporting people um, uh, and uh, uh, using immigration law that was proved to be unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court with the change in the Supreme Court that could be changed and state police in southern states could be mobilized to ex not only state police but even cashier registers in, 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 uh, in supermarkets could be asking for IDs and asking illegal immigrants uh, uh, and reporting on illegal immigrants and having them deported. So it obviously depends on who you are. If you're sitting in Massachusetts, the United States is a federal country which, in which states have much more autonomy and, and political responsibility and say the autonomous communities here in Spain. So if you're sitting in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine or California and Northern California and Oregon and Seattle, probably nothing's really to be worried about in four years it can be done. But if you're a legal immigrant or even suspected of being a legal immigrant in the southern states, it could be extremely um, disadvantageous if in four years he succeeds in renegotiating NAFTA and putting up uh, uh, walls and in fact starting a domino effect of, of trade wars in, in, in the whole world that could have massive um, uh, uh, effects and they, I'm sure the annulling the Trans-Pacific Partnership isn't very big but I think in four years he can do lots of damage I think in four years he will do lots of damage I think despite not being a psychopath he will react in in, 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 in ways that probably will look for scapegoats and to blame his losses on his inability to put through his program on probably uh, minorities and, and it could be pretty ugly for four years but I do think it will be re reversed. <laughs> That's what they said in 1933-34 about Hitler. Uh, we can trust Goering. He's a very reasonable man. Uh, the office of chancellor will calm him down. Uh, it will force the, the needs of German society and of the German state will force Hitler into a rational policy in Europe and into rational policy goals. It didn't work out that way. Uh, so, I'm not that sanguine. It's a no, no, I'm just, I don't know. There are too many things here to discuss, so I will leave all the yeah, space to the, to the public. Say, yeah. yeah, so we, we're opening the, uh, the floor for questions. Nice. Uh, Hello, uh, my name is Daniel and I'm a student here at Universidad Pompeu Fabra. And I must say that I have a huge problem with the visions of Ruth Shalai or Gail Jones. Because um, if I have to put an example, before we heard the conference of uh, Girao and, and Robies, and Fernando Girao, for example, explained me very well, and I think to all the audience, uh, why the things happen. Uh, what, what are the causes of the Brexit, for example? And uh, listening to Gail Jones, I have the impression that she thinks that uh, all the American people that vote for Trump and uh, indeed the reason of uh, Trump's victory is because people is stupid, is because people is racist, is because people is misogynistic and so on. Uh, I agree with the conclusions of Ushalai uh, that um, we have to uh, wait and we don't know what will come out of, of Trump's presidency. But all this stuff about relating Trump to fascism, to Hitler, to Nazism, and all this stuff, I think is completely out of touch. I would like to know why so many people vote for Trump, why so many polls uh, didn't come out as they had to come out. So. Uh, Hillary's uh, victory, I want to know uh, uh, which are the real reasons uh, um, person uh, who is like Donald Trump, that I agree that is completely disgusting, now is ruining United States of America. And I don't think that the profound causes and the profound uh, things behind uh, his winning are uh, the racist me uh, messages and all this stuff. So my question to you is, is there, um, if you consider, consider yourself liberal, uh, progressive, like, for example, I consider myself, is there uh, some critic to uh, the previous years in American politics? Is there some critic for, uh, uh, from our ideology to do, uh, to understand why this man is in charge now without saying that uh, the people is manipulated by the media 
to say that the, the social media is all... I would like to know this. Actually, Thank you. I, I get the impression that maybe you didn't listen to my talk. Because in the very beginning, I gave you eight reasons why I thought that he won. And those reasons were not only racism. Racism was only one of the reasons that I mentioned. I mentioned a number of other factors, uh, some of them that had to do with uh, these economic problems that all of us have been mentioning, huh? uh, others that had to do with Hillary's own failings her campaign, uh, and her campaign strategy, uh, others that had to do with um, uh, mis uh, misogynist uh, attitudes and handling, which uh, not only myself, but my other two colleagues mentioned as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I will just simply uh, say that, you know, that I've already, I think, uh, responded uh, to, those, uh, to those questions, uh, to those issues. And I never said, of course, that uh, or implied that people are just uh, stupid or they're just racist, right? There's a lot of other um, uh, issues that are at play. Uh, also, I should mention that the reflections that I was mentioning are not simply my own uh, opinion that I've just thought up. And maybe you're thinking, maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh, she's a woman, oh, she's African American, and so therefore she's thinking that way. I'm getting my information from people that I have consulted with, people who are, for, exa uh, for example, uh, members of uh, various Muslim American uh, associations, mm -hmm. uh, members of various other ethnic minority uh, associations, and so I'm simply reflecting uh, their perceptions and quoting actual facts and data by the FBI. So, therefore, it's not just my perceptions, all right? Um, I was making two points. One is that I think that this is a changing point. It's a chronological changing point. Uh, and that uh, the personality factor is qualitatively significant. Uh, clearly, the office of presidency can be limiting to the personality of the president. But uh, the key remains to be seen as of the 20th of January of next year to what extent the Republican Party will back this up or not. As to why Trump was elected in the first place, part of it has to do with the nature of the electoral system in the United States, uh, which means that a uh, popular vote is not what counts, it counts by districts, it counts by states, and it's a winner-take-all for an electoral college, so it's a, a double system, and it was designed that way in the 18th century, so that it would not have uh, produced mob tyranny, but have a cooling effect on uh, resolution. There is considerable discussion about whether this should be changed or not, now, in part, as a result of the elections. But of course, as Gidao said earlier, uh, this kind of discussion is very loaded. That is to say, the people who lose, that is to say Democrats, uh, tend to say that the Electoral College should be eliminated. The people who win, Republicans, say that it shouldn't. So it's, it's, uh, we get back to the political problem behind it. Uh, the control by the Republicans of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and what they will do with that control, whether that control will be at Trump's service or whether that control will block Trump's initiatives. Uh, this is what uh, I think uh, uh, Linda Jones and I were particularly stressing. Um, that said, uh, what w in, as a, how did the, the elections uh, come about, I tried to indicate my criteria, which is that I think that uh, there is a long-term structural change in uh, the social dynamics of, of uh, Western economies. I think that uh, this affects uh, working class, uh, untutored, uh, uneducated sectors who've done only 
uh, secondary education are even less and who therefore have very cheap jobs which are now getting cheaper. And so there is a, a social problem throughout Europe and North America and parts of South America, more industrial or uh, urbanized parts, in which this is visible. But that this also is affecting educa uh, educated elites, intelligentsia, which to some extent implies everybody in this room, uh, and that these sectors are being equally wiped out, and that uh, there is a confrontation, as it were, between the poorer sectors and the intellectual sectors, which I think has a lot to do with why Trump won and against whom the slogans he was using were di directed, and why uh, uh, Hillary Clinton lost and uh, why her, she was perceived as cold, elitist, distant, while Trump, being really very emotive and in, incoherent, was perceived as warm, close, and direct. There's a, another factor which has not been discussed by anyone here, uh, except myself, perhaps, and only glancingly, which is that uh, when I was speaking of change in parasitism, I mentioned that you go from press to TV to uh, social media. Uh, the Trump message, and, and Guidao mentioned that things are uh, a, a tweet away. Uh, Trump works, he just tweets things, uh, just emotional reactions usually. Now you can discuss whether these are calculated emotional reactions or whether they're gut emotional reactions. But, um, it's clear that Trump dominates both TV as a reality show style and is capable of transforming that reality show style into a substitute for traditional political organization. He has no party. He has followers. But those followers are really fans, and they respond like fans. And what he's substituting uh, party organization with, something Lyndon uh, Linda Jones was talking about getting out the vote uh, is simply mass use of Twitter, Facebook, etc., which are mechanisms which at, point, at this point a lot of people use to get information. A lot of people who do not read print culture, who barely even watch TV anymore, and just live off of what exists in social media. And what exists in social media is unchecked in all the senses of the word. It's uncontrolled and it's unverified. And consequently, it spreads a lot of messages. That's why I cited the case of Pizzagate and how this goes to the heart. Ryan, Ryan Jr. Was, had to be fired for Pizzagate last week um, because he continued to say after the attack uh, la the Sunday before last, he continued to say that uh, the uh, pedophile abortion uh, network working out of the pizzeria was still there and that Hillary was running it, uh, which is, you know, this is tout trou in Belgium taken to the nth degree of fantasy life. Uh, but there's no control on that. And this is a new medium. And this style of reality show politics that doesn't even have the limits and controls of television, but is working absolutely, as I say, unchecked in all the senses, is a qualitative change. So you have something someone who is working through methods that no one understands or controls, which have a clear age orientation. That is to say, younger people understand them, older people don't. And uh, Trump is able to deal with this, and is able to deal with this in a, an extremely uh, thick-skinned, this is paradoxical, he's very thin-skinned, but he's able to use this in a very effective way. When I use thin-skinned, thick-skinned, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, I'll give you an image from the PowerPoint, some images from the PowerPoint I was going to uh, develop. Uh, okay? See, uh, I'm getting here. There I'm going. Okay. Uh, I was talking about this. You're talking about someone. They were talking about the slogans. I was talking about what his characteristic that he says. And he has two key phrases. One from The Apprentice, which is, you're fired. And the other one is, it's a disaster. 
He never actually explains why anything is a disaster. When he was suggesting last week Ben Carson uh, for uh, health education and welfare, uh, he started talking about the Nans National Institute of uh, Health. And he says, everybody knows, it's a disaster. No check, no control, no explanation. It's a disaster. That's it. So uh, you're talking about a kind of uh, presentation which uh, is extremely shallow, but very attractive. And this is a new radical epistemology. There's no truth in advertising. It's just what, what sells goes. And to give you a shocking, uh, what sells, uh, what, uh, you, you know, naked intimacy. That's her. She doesn't care. Uh, so uh, that's uh, a kind of projection. Thin skin, thick skin. That's a kind of projection that's very difficult to manage and indicates the capacity for attraction and the lack of internal restraints that exist in the Trump camp itself, in the Trump family as Trump defines it, without Marla Maples, without Marla Maples' daughter, but uh, without Ivana, though Ivana gives her blessing from the outside, but with the children who are in principle going to inherit, inherit in, uh, are going to run as a quote unquote blind trust all the Trump interests, which is very difficult. So what happens? Does Congress, House of Representatives, Senate, challenge the, uh, the Trump uh, trust mechanisms? What happens with all the international deals that Trump has engaged in, how does one control those? How do those affect international policy? These are all very serious problems and very hard to deal with. Um, I don't know if I had anything. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, so it was in this sense that I was speaking of, uh, of Hitlerism, which is that there is the discourse that it's all reasonable that this has been a necessary demagoguery to win the elections, but that these people will turn reasonable. You can work with them, and I'm not sure. I think that this morning a very clear case was made for how appalling the Brexit experience could be, but at the same time, how one could make a very rational interpretation of Theresa May as a rational player on a slow, on a short-term and long-term basis. I find it very unlikely, personally, though it may indeed happen, that this can be done with Trump. But the loose ends are enormous. I hope that serves to answer your questions. Thank you very much for the interventions. I think the political and mediatic establishment cannot uh, complain the people who voted uh, Brexit or Trump of being stupid because the political stupidness is a consequence of the neoliberalism. Uh, versus the neoliberalism and the populism, it's necessary more republicanism. So, my question is, starting from a um, le uh, logic political fact in which we have to say we cannot tolerate how can we recognize UK and US populisms as a, uh, legitimate political actors to build among all a minimum Commonwealth or Respublica. Uh, well, I, I would just say that um, um, the legitimacy of any political party is not in question. The legitimacy of Nigel Farage or UKIP is not in question. Um, the legitimacy of the vote is not in question. Um, the question is another one. It's whether people are voting for their own 
their best interests or not. I mean, it basically is a question of conversation. Uh, the, um, the main argument against Brexit it, it is self-defeating, is that the aims that you seek to achieve by voting Brexit, when you vote Brexit, are not going to be fulfilled by voting Brexit, in essence. But the problem is that this is a rational argument, and the problem with populism is that it, it, it doesn't play by pure rational calculations. It plays by emotional, combination of emotional manipulation, lies, and the, the point I made in my talk, which I would like to insist on again, the role of the media is crucial. If you've been telling people for 30 years that Europe is the source of your problems, when you have a chance to vote, the subliminal message is there. You will vote against if you're not particularly well-educated or well-connected. And that's what happened. I, no, no, not, not stupid. They don't have all the elements of judgment. I would... Yeah, I will say I will disagree with that. I will disagree with that. Um, um, I think what we should be looking at, really, is why people, why a majority of our citizens are not defending what we consider that should be defended. Why they're not defending that sort of system that we think we should have why a majority of voters are not defending those values that we think should be our values. Instead of looking at people voting for Trump, because altogether, the kind of things that Linda has taught us, unfortunately, have been in the United States forever. They have all the time been there. Now, what we have is because of Trump, uh, because of all this discourse, we are just, we are just putting all them you know, on surface. And we might pay much more attention to all these issues. Unfortunately, these issues were there. Unfortunately, Trump has gotten even less votes than Romney. Mm -hmm. He's president of the United States with even less votes. So the problem here is not the whole, those who voted Trump. The problem here is those who did not vote for Clinton. Mm -hmm. Why millions of people stayed at home? Yeah. When you had that guy with the possibility of becoming president of the United States, mm -hmm. how people did not feel concerned. That is the problem. So and the, and the, re, the answer to that, what I'm to say now, is because malaise is wide extended. And we don't want to face that reality. We tend to think that cannot be possible. It is possible. There's a big junk of our populations which are angry, mm -hmm. fed up. And they just want an excuse just to kick some butt. <laughs> just, 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 you know, just put them to vote anything. They will just try to do to damage. Why do we have so much people angry and willing to damage even themselves? Even themselves. Why do we have that? This is my obsession. Why do we have that? How can we reduce that? And the problem is basically that for 25 years, I mean, I'm not kidding, I'm not talking two weekends, two years, or I'm talking about 25 years, we have not been paying attention to that people. They were the losers. They deserve it. We, are not, we have not been applying the kind of policies that we have been applying in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in the 1970s in order to redress that situation, in order to get what we call allegiance. And we, what we have now is that we have no allegiance to the system. The system is not being supported. The system needs to be rethought. We're not doing that. We are not doing that. So my, for the future, my expectation is that this is going to grow. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Because we're going to get more people into that sort of situation of anti-anything. 
You can call it anti-system, anti-globalization, anti-elite, uh, casta, name it. It's going to be an anti-thing. So what we need is to improve the quality of our democracies. That's what we need. Our democracies are getting into a worse situation, and that is being a progressive kind of movement. We have a much worse democracies in the United States and in Europe than we used to have, I don't know how many years ago. Because the political system was able to identify, it was able to identify what was the interest of the majority of the people. It was simpler. I'm not, I'm not simplifying. It was simpler at that point in time because the, 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 the electoral constituency has been fragmented. It's much more fragmented. Mm -hmm. It used to be 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But <laughs> the problem is that the political system is not even trying to do that. Just go there when they have to vote. When there is an election, oh, they, they go just frenzy, try to, to, to find out what it's, you know, but the, the electoral constituency is not well represented. It's not well represented. And we are not doing that. We are not reducing that problem. And we should be doing that. We should be looking not to the people who voted Trump, but those who stayed home and didn't go to vote. I said, no, I'm not concerned about that. Well, I mean, this was six million people. Not only that, six million people voted for Obama and didn't vote for, for, for Clinton. And I was thinking, you know, they, they, maybe, maybe they were thinking, oh, Clinton is not as good as Obama. But boy, what's the alternative? Trump did, didn't even feel concerned about that. That's the problem. Yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more yeah. with that. And yeah. I, ha I have no response for it. No. The only thing I would ever say to people is that any vote that did not go all of the people who were complaining about Trump and saying they were complaining about him, but at the, second, but at the same time there was a level of, of a dismissive kind of a attitude that, oh, he couldn't possibly win. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but my feeling always was that the stakes were very high and that basically any vote that was not explicitly uh, given to her was a vote for him. So either through abstention or by voting for one of the other two candidates, that those votes, that actually was going to benefit Trump. That's the way I, I, I saw that. What I don't have uh, 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 beyond, I don't have a further explanation beyond the fact that there was a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of, you know, disaffectation, you know, a lot of people feeling that, um, uh, somebody like Hillary Clinton, who very much represents the system, just wasn't in, couldn't represent their interests at that at that moment. Yeah, uh, just a couple things. First, uh, in terms of why they voted for Trump, I think the most convincing article that I read on it was a article that had been cited widely by George Packer called "Hillary Clinton and the Populist Revolt um, in the uh, New York the New Yorker," which is a fantastic. Uh, analysis of of these uh, reasons of the Democrats ab uh, abandoning the, um, the the white voters in the in the Rust Belt in particular, and and I think it's a very fair article which does not portray all the Trump voters as, as racist in in any sense of the imagination, but um, more as as victims of again uh, rising inequality during a period of of rising um, growth, which is the ultimate um, problem. Um, with these Rust Belt states in particular. So I think that there's, you know, a very strong economic nationalist argument, particularly in the Rust Belt, particularly, again, among those counties that I mentioned voted overwhelmingly for Obama and, don't, in my opinion, were not racist in the very least and ended up voting for Trump for economic nationalist uh, matters. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's a very um, important point, especially in the Rust Belt, and again, a reason why the election could be overturned in four years if, if, uh, if Trump, and he, which he will not be able to do, is able to reverse trends on inequality. Secondly, in terms of voting turnout, I'm not convinced by the argument, because voting turnout is very difficult for, uh, in the United States elections, because most of the states aren't contested. So, for example, in the state where there was most voter turnout, which was Wisconsin, which was 70 percent, it voted, it moved away from Hillary Clinton to Trump. So I don't think that the problem of the Americans, uh, the Democrats, was inability to get to voter turnout. Again, if you look at the Hispanic vote 
even though perhaps Hispanics might not have, and we still don't have the figures turned out to the extent, although they might have actually, to the extent for Hillary Clinton as they did for Obama in terms of percentages, there were more Hispanic voters than ever before for demographic reasons. So the voter turnout, um, it, it's not clear that the, that, that the uh, inability of, of Hillary Clinton to get a strong voter turnout uh, was her, her, uh, her downfall. And, uh, and that if there had been a higher turnout in some key sectors, I mean, obviously among black populations in Florida, it would have made a difference, but not necessarily in the Rust Belt. So it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very diffi uh, a, a difficult argument. I, I think, uh, again, I, I, I just tend to be less cataclysmic about this because I don't see a fundamental difference between George W. Bush and, and Donald Trump. Um, I'm used to the Tea Party. I see them all the time. Um, uh, although I am, I, in a short period of time, I am extremely nervous of what could happen, especially with the cabinet appointments. And Saturday Night Live this weekend, they just had a, a spoof on uh, Donald Trump appointing the protagonist of Breaking Bad to head the National Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> and so um, his cabinet appointments, as well as the, as well as the Supreme Court appointments, as well as a house dominated by, uh, by Paul Ryan and with large Tea Party alliances means that they could do a lot of damage in four years. And, so, uh, and also with response to this, this fact that, well, it can't be for racist and, and misogynist reasons, well, it can because the voting spreads were so small in the such key states, in states like Philadelphia, in, in states like Pennsylvania and like Michigan, the voting spreads were just a few hundred thousand voters who perhaps didn't want to have a, a woman in the, in the White House. I don't know, until a woman can win in a major uh, European or American uh, a country from, a, from the political left, I w I, I'm not convinced that these small spreads can be affected by misogyny and, and to some lesser extent, racism. And so uh, I think that, that it's not a question of the whole United States voting um, in, in this racist manner, uh, but it's a question of very specific population, or in, in misogynist matters, very specific population, specific counties. Even going back to Jersey Shore, if Jersey Shore had been part of, part of Pennsylvania, which is essentially what it is since it's a suburb of, of Philadelphia, then Pennsylvania would have voted Democrat and we would have had a different, different outcome. So it's still a very divided country, very close country, and even in the best of circumstances without a populist candidate, the spreads in most of the states are roughly what they were today. I mean, there are very few contested states. In fact, there's probably more contested states now than ever, but, um, but the, in, in general, at least with the last two Bush elections with, uh, against uh, Kerry. And, uh, and against um, Gore, the, uh, the, the, the Democrat and Republican states were, were pretty very, were very much stable. Thank you. Very short. Very short. Uh, just as an indication of local concerns, especially in the uh, central part of the United States, upper Midwest, uh, that are not discussed at this macro level but could have an enormous impact on, on small towns. Um, there's a raging uh, opiate, uh, analgesic opiate uh, epidemic in the United States uh, with products like oxycodone, uh, which are affecting strongly working class uh, and uh, lower middle class uh, voters. Why? Because uh, synthetic opiates were produced by big pharma uh, and pushed uh, through doctors uh, in the, over the last uh, 15 years, approximately. And uh, these have created a, these are highly addictive analgesics, which create a huge demand, which, which can't be necessarily fed by uh, uh, continuing with prescription. They're also very expensive, so that many people who are addicted have ended up using heroin as a cheap substitute. And there were uh, several interesting uh, reportage done uh, on this subject around September, October, which were indicating that this was Trump country, that there was the feeling that Trump was going to produce a, a sense of authority and order that would eliminate these problems and create, bring back what small town reality had been before these changes. I give this as an example of things that are not talked about, but which exist and which are major indicators. And then as a macro point, I would say that when, I, when I'm arguing that this, the 2016 is significant, that it isn't just a blip on the, uh, that will be recovered, is because I'm seeing, as of the 1930s, without the same 
necessarily the same ideological implications, a collapse of the classic left-right uh, polarization. This is, this, these are votes that do not correspond to a clear left-right angle. The people who are supposed to be supporting the left are voting for the right. Uh, sectors that traditionally support the right are now suddenly panicking and supporting the left. Uh, and you see this as a change. You see this as an overall Atlantic change. And um, it remains to be seen what that will turn into. That is simply as in terms of trying to pick up uh, what uh, both uh, Joan Powell and uh, Fernando were, were indicating and what we were indicating for the United States that this kind of standard discourse that uh, as historians we're almost irreflexively used to is perhaps after 2016 no longer valid and uh, that the standard left in Europe is in shambles uh, and that uh, the right is changing and what does this signify? And we don't really know. Uh, okay, maybe one last question from the audience. Uriol, you had a question? Bueno, yo, una, una cuestión que, que el Jake ha posado mucho relleu eh, y que no estoy del todo de acuerdo, que esta sensación de que el Donald Trump té certa, no es gaire diferente del, del George Bush, a mí, yo no estoy del todo de acuerdo en, 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 en algunas cuestiones. Y, y tú me has dicho algunas cosas que son contradictorias. El, George, el final del George Bush va a permitir la entrada en el discurso político del Tea Party de manera muy fuerte y el tipo de discurso que ha hecho el Donald Trump, no necesariamente en la persona del Donald Trump, pero pot, el, el Partido Republicano puede incorporar Moltes de estas propuestas, discursos o cualquier cosa, hay siempre el discurso del que un político puede decir en público y eso puede ser incorporado. Y también no estoy de acuerdo con el Jean Paul Rubies de que el Brexit puede ser, eh, digamos, más definitivo que, que la entrada de Donald Trump. A, 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 bueno, has dicho más o menos que es más fácil de. de Dígame, no, es he dicho que es más fácil de hacer fuera el Trump, que no sí, pasa de revertir el Brexit, que pero es el Trump diferent. No, pero el Trump no es, no es només él, es el discurso que ella ha, ha posado sobre la taula y el, y, y el fet que si hagués perdut habría sido molt más fácil, pero el fet de haber guanyat ha legitimado socialmente todo lo que es puede hacer en público. Yo creo que el Trump se desacreditará, o la cuestión es lo que trigui, en desacreditarse y el cost que tingui, això es molt parecido. Bueno, de otra manera, la, la cuestión que quería tornar es que me ha dicho, si la gente vota por una cosa que no es necesariamente en sus mejores intereses, no es porque sea estúpida, es que la racionalidad es relativa a la información y a los presupuestos ideológicos. Y cuando tú lees el Daily Mail durante 20 años, tendrás una información y unos presupuestos ideológicos completamente diferentes que una persona que está leyendo The Guardian o el Financial Times, en cada estés viviendo en el mismo pueblo. Por tanto, aquí están hablando no de que unos sean inteligentes y otros sean estúpidos, sino que unos tienen una información diferente y, un, y, un, y, un, y, un, y una referencia ideológica es completamente diferente. Uh, última pregunta, algú, algú del público. Uh, I'm, I'm coming from uh, art history and I've been doing a little bit uh, of history of emotions. And I thought it's very interesting to apply some of what has been going on in terms of debate on the history of emotions to your comments in particular, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Girao. I, I didn't know you, so I'm very sorry for that. Uh, it, what, what, what we're handling now a kind of uh, tool in order to understand what people did when they voted for Trump, where we are visualizing Trump, uh, these Trump voters as releasing themselves emotionally when they did it, you know, they unleashed their darker side in somehow their prejudices uh, and certainly their economic anguish. Uh, certainly that we're claiming. History of emotions would be telling us, well, why not picture it as people who have been uh, habituated to a certain kind of angry emo emotivity. So it's some, something of an anger emotion that you wear on the outside and that you share with others that becomes a currency within your community and that you've just grown into, like any other prejudice. Uh, they, they would be talking about emotional uh, practices, uh, emotional communities, which regulate these uh, 
uh, systems of emotional transactions, and which would go some way towards, in a sense, explaining what Jacob was, uh, was doing, uh, to say that it appears to be that on the map there are certain uh, regions where the racial rationale seems to explain things, and there are others where the racial rationale doesn't explain them. Uh, which would mean that certain communities have adopted uh, a racial prejudice as, as a kind of legitimate way of looking at politics, and others haven't. But that they have grown into it. Uh, this ties up again with, with Rubies, the fact that you have been receiving for 30 years information on the European Union, which is only prejudicial to the European Union, of course, gives you the uh, legitimate feeling that your emotion is right. And uh, in that sense, it's just uh, a comment that goes towards saying that uh, the image that we have of the Trump voter as suddenly releasing something that is really there, that is really stored up because of real social pressures. It may, of course, do some of the explaining, but we also have to keep in mind that people are uh, 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 taking in information that uh, uh, becomes a currency in communities and that they are being uh, led on by certain languages, discourses maybe. Hmm? That is just a comment. Let me make a comment, since that uh, uh, the, the electoral constituencies in the United Kingdom and in the United States are hu is immense, huge. So who knows? Who knows who vote, why people voted one way or the other, individually, even by groups? It's very complicated. That's very complicated. But the one thing that we know from, from history is that emotions, emotions determine determined elections when the material reward behind them is deteriorating rapidly. So here, what the, what the problem we have here is a lot of people that is feeling themselves to be losers, to be some sort of sentiment of not being benefited by the system, and then at that point in time, their angry becomes entangled with many other issues, all right? If it is only just emotion, and when you have, when you say, you know, growth is, is going on, 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 for instance, there, there is a report that says that industrial, industrial wages in the United States had estimated for 25 years. What would you vote if your year wage for 25 years has alternated while everybody else, from your point of view, is becoming richer, is benefiting from the system? At one point in time, there's a point of saturation. There's a point in which you say, oh, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a click. And that then, emotion comes, then you have a candidate telling you exactly what you are feeling. It's, it's, it's just verbalizing what you are feeling. At that point in time, then you become conscious of your own situation. Because you're not really bad. The thing is that you, you are, you're worse off than other people, than your neighbors, than other, other, you know, and then you just feel angry, and then you vote. I think, I'm not going to be a historian. You are, you, are, you are a historian of emotions. Therefore, you deal with emotions, I deal with economic reward. And I think is the deterioration of the economic reward, what can explain, it's the bedrock upon which all this is happening. Yeah, I, I see a little danger in that, in the sense that, there will come a time when the Democrats uh, and Labour will uh, consider adopting populist uh, stances in order to seduce the electorate back. And if we say that the anger is there uh, objectively because the economic context for it is absolutely objectively there, which is, well, of course I agree with them, I'm, I'm coming from Marxism and so on, but if we do that, then we also legitimize populism as a legitimate means to Seduce back. No, I'm not where, saying that. Where does You're, it end? I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not saying that. That's you are saying that. I'm not okay, saying that. I'm, I'm what I'm saying is you need to improve the you need to improve the living standard of the, of your your entire population, or you need to get you need to get better education. You need to get more um, more uh, um, equality. You need to even there are many things that you can do. None of them we are doing that. Uh, education is not a priority in any government, whether the United States or any European uh, um, uh, countries. Education is not a priority. Equality is not a priority. So we have problems here. And the problem is that we are not addressing the things that are causing all this malaise. And there is a huge malaise. Believe it or not, there is a huge malaise. And we need to reverse that. And the only way, I mean, the only way you cannot do that is basically by populist uh, 
populist uh, discourse because what he just said to them is I'm going to solve that quickly, rapidly, and painfully. And it's not going to happen like that. So they're going to be dis dis discredited. But if the malaise continues to, to grow, then at that point in time, the, 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 the amount of people being angry uh, is going to grow. Fascism, fascism, the bedrock of fascism was the economic crisis. Without the economic crisis, there would have not been fascism. Simple as that. I just wanted to, very quickly, because I know that we want to have lunch now, but the question about populism and the left, I think, is important. The Labour Party is a good example. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with UKIP. UKIP is taking them votes. There are many voters in the UK who tell, who tell the Labour candidates, I am still a Labour supporter because my father and my grandfather were workers and therefore I am part of you, but I'm going to vote UKIP for this election or I'm going to vote Brexit or this, or this, or this referendum because I don't want immigrants. And the question is that the Labour has trying, is, is not finding a way of putting together what it believes intellectually and what the voters are asking for. Because Labour doesn't believe that actually that your problem is to do just with immigration. And, and, and they don't believe that actually taking away rights from workers is a good idea to move around. But at the same time, they, they've been told this is what we want. So that's the real difficulty. The, the, the right is playing populist cards much more effectively than the left in the UK. Okay. Thank you very much. Ho deixem aquí. Podríem continuar discutint, cosa que podem fer a fora. Gràcies a tots per venir, gràcies als cinc participants. Crec que ha sigut un èxit i bon profit.